Okay. Okay. So um, I guess I guess we can I guess we can uh, go ahead and uh, go ahead and start and um, probably the uh, probably the easiest uh, uh, probably the easiest way to um, uh, to, 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 to work this. Um, I guess we can start going through, um, let me think. Okay. okay, I'm minimizing, okay, I'm minimizing. Maybe like the last final or something. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so let's take a look at, um, um, probably, let me see, let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, give me a second here too. Yeah, so the uh, final exams that are posted on the department website, they are going to be a little bit different in structure and format uh, from the uh, uh, from the actual final because those were written uh, under the assumption that you'd have we'd have in person classes and the structure was a little bit different. So some of the questions are similar and some of them uh, some of them are not. Let me. Uh, um, let me pull out a couple of questions that'll probably be um, uh, probably be. Uh, let's see. All right, let me just go ahead and copy this whole thing. Uh, that's probably okay. Yes, yeah, so let me pull a couple of uh, somewhat representative questions. Okay, so I'll pull a couple of uh, questions out of here. I have a question for Professor um, John Bassis. Like, how do we know if the accommodation for the different time is going to be like granted for us? Um, I'm, I'm going to grant everybody's time. I, I have all your emails. So, so just pop up during the time we told you and. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. Okay. I, I too have a question. I just wanted to ask, um, since the exam is going to be taking on the My Open Math um, website, I noticed that on some of the homeworks, like if you didn't put like the correct parentheses or something like that, you don't get any points. Is that going to be the same thing for the exam? Like if we get the correct answer, but don't, how do I explain? Like don't put the right put it in the right sequence as it, it requires us to, are we going to lose, is it going to be a complete zero or are we going to have some points? So, uh, so part of the reason that uh, you'll be able to add work on uh, to the exam is that is that uh, uh, your professor will be able to see that okay you did you did the actual work uh, on, on this question and be able to give you credit for the question. So, so it's sort of this backup to, I mean, in, in, in addition to showing the work that you did, it's sort of a backup to that. Uh, so, I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah, the idea is that you should be able to, you, you should be able to get credit for it if, yeah, if, if there's like a syntax error or something like that, it will, uh, as long as you have the, as long as you have your work, as long as you attach your work to the, uh, uh, to the exam, uh, then your professor will be able to, uh, will be able to uh, take that into account. All right, thank you. Okay, so all right, so let's uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the somewhat representative questions from the uh, uh, from one of the previous exams. So I think this is the last uh, paper exam that we have up there, and so uh, so here we have a situation where we have a, a Venn diagram. Uh, and we know something about our universe of sets uh, and what the sets T and C and A all represent. And so, uh, so, so, so the idea here is that remember the Venn diagram, uh, if you're inside a circle, that means that you're a member of a particular set. So for example, something like this, um, 
the we want to describe the set notation. Let me uh, let me zoom in a little bit more on that. Um, okay, so so again, the idea here is that I'll use this. Uh, so so if I'm in a set, so if I'm say at this point, uh, then well, let's let's think about that. So if you're in that point, uh, if you're at that point, then you're in the set T. So that's the set of tennis players. Um, well, let me ask. Uh, so, so let's ask this question: uh, Is this a person who plays chess? No. Yeah, it's not a person who plays chess. If they play chess, they should be in the uh, in in the in the set C. Uh, so, where do you put a person who is a tennis player and also somebody who plays chess? So our regions are numbered there. So where would they end up? In two. two. In two, probably, in two. yeah. Uh, potentially, they may be in five as well. We haven't committed ourselves to whether or not they're artists. Uh, but certainly, somebody who plays tennis and is also a chess player, they should end up in this region, too. And so let's uh, talk about this. So we, so OK, so let's try to translate this. So we want all, everybody who's an artist, uh, but they're not people, they do not play tennis. So first of all, so the artists are, uh, the artists are all in this set A and they don't play tennis. So, uh, so let's think about this. Uh, so there's four regions that are there, four, five, six, and seven. So who, uh, so, so which regions should we include in artists who don't play tennis? Seven and six. Six and seven, right. Just, just these two regions. We don't want these regions four and five. Uh, so this is region six and seven. And now let's think about how we describe that. Uh, so remember there's, uh, there's three, um, there's three set um, symbols. Uh, four really, if you count, uh, let me get that to a smaller. Uh, there's uh, three or four set, uh, set uh, operations. Um, and so we have the union of two sets. We have the uh, union of two sets. Oh, really? There we go. Uh, we have the intersection of two sets. We have the set complement. And we don't really like to use it, but it does exist as a notation. We also have the set difference. So remember that the union is either or. You're either in A or you're in B. Uh, the intersect is uh, both and. You have to be both in A and also in B. Uh, the complement is not. Uh, so the complement is we're not in A and the set difference, this is kind of the weird one. This is in A, but not in B. Now, part of the reason that we don't use the set compl uh, sorry, the set difference very much is that we can actually reword this. We don't really need set difference. It's not a, it's not a critical operation uh, because if you take the statement apart uh, in A, but not in B. Uh, so what's another way we can phrase in A, but not in B? Well, so here's the starting point. Is that an either something or something, or is it a both and? Either. Is it either in A or not in B? Is that what but translates as? Wait, can you repeat the question? So, so the question is this word, but. Uh, uh, the word, but, when we use that in, in our set notation, um, it's, it's uh, well, well, the question is, how do we interpret but? Is it an either or, or is it a both and? So uh, give me a sentence uh, that uses the word, but. Uh, something, but something. Uh, how about green, but uh, how about not alive? Isn't that it kind of describes or? most of my plants. Wouldn't it be uh, both and? It's got to be a both and. So if I say something but something, I'm really meaning green 
and also not alive. So here's a useful idea. Uh, when you run into that word but in a, uh, in, a, in a statement, it really translates as a, I didn't mean to do that, it really translates as an intersection. So this set difference, uh, another way we can look at it, so in A, so you have to be in A and also not, well, there's our negation, not in B. So remember, there's our four set, uh, our four, uh, four set operations. Again, this this set difference is not really uh, is not really a separate operation. It's really a special case of a combination of an intersection and a complement. Okay, so let's think about this. Uh, how do you want to phrase the set of artists who do not play tennis? So first of all, are we talking about an either or, or are we talking about a both and? challenge with conjunctions, by the way, is that usually if we have an either or statement, we'll actually say something or something. Uh, it's hard to phrase a union without using the word or. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it's really easy to phrase a conjunction and not use the word and. We could use the word but, uh, this, but, something else. So uh, do we have a, is this statement? Is that a both of these things, or is it one of these things or the other of these things? The both. It's a both, right? So if you think about this, let's reword this a little bit. Um, so uh, these are people who, uh, well, it's a both and, so are, maybe I'll phrase it this way, both artists, and they don't play tennis. And so because this is a both and, uh, let me just check, I think I heard somebody just show up. Oh, guess not. Uh, okay, so, uh, so because this is a both and, well, we know what the artists are. The artists are the set A, so that's A. It's a both and, and they don't play tennis. So that's tennis and we'll negate that. Uh, so we would, um, so we describe the, this group of people, both artists, they're both in the set A and also intersect, negate, tennis, they do not play tennis. And so there's one way of describing our region. Uh, again, the other way we could describe this region, uh, remember that this particular construction also corresponds to a set difference. Uh, so we could also, we could also phrase it this way. So this is going to be A, remove anybody who's in T. Now, uh, if you actually have the Venn diagram in front of you, if you actually have the Venn diagram in front of you, uh, then this set difference notation is maybe a little bit more intuitive. Uh, there's a useful approach to many problems in mathematics, uh, but particularly any problem where you're given a diagram or a picture or a figure, uh, I call it scotch tape and scissors. Uh, the idea is that you want to construct something and you can do two things. Uh, you could either tape two things together or you can use scissors and remove a section from something else. So uh, again, if you have the words, if you have the words, it's probably easiest to go through this idea that union is an either or, intersect is a both and, uh, and then that'll get you to this form. If you have the picture, uh, so actually, so let's uh, even take a look at this. Describe set six uh, in set notation. Uh, if you have the picture, uh, it might be easiest to think about this as either gluing together regions or uh, gluing together regions or cutting out the regions that you don't want. So uh, so let's uh, uh, so 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 this uh, so this second form artists who don't play tennis. As soon as you identify that's region six and seven. One way you might look at that is this is also this region A, and we're going to remove that region, uh, that region there. And if you look at where that region comes from, that region is actually part of 
one. So the other way we could have gotten this, once we identify that it's this region six and seven, it's really the set A, but we're going to take away, we're going to remove everything that's in this, uh, in this uh, set T. So that's where this A remove T notation comes from. Again, from the verbal description, it's probably easier to figure out whether we have an either or or a both and, and then get the uh, notation. If you have the visual picture, if you have a picture, you might find it easier to write it as a set difference. Uh, specifically, in this particular case, we do have this second problem here. We want to describe this region six. Let me uh, reset my diagram. So if we want to describe that region six in set notation, uh, let's build six. Uh, so scotch tape and scissors. If you want to build six, So to get six, so what do we want to start with? If I want to get this region six, so I'll pull out my scotch tape and scissors. Uh, what do we start with? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Six. Well, yeah, we, we want to get this region six. So we could either glue it together from smaller pieces or we could cut it from a larger piece. So, well, let's cut it from what a larger it, piece. What is it part of? We have three C, sets, T, a. C, and A. So what's it part of? What? A C and A. Sure. Okay, let's start with A. So let's start with A. So that's this set. So here's the set A. Okay, so now if I want to get if I want to get six, uh, what I need to do, that's a really terrible drawing. Um, if I want to get six, uh, if I just want to get six, what do I have to do? What do I have to cut out? Do you have to cut out four and five? I have to cut out four five, and I also have to cut out seven. Oh. Okay, so here's, uh, here's, where, here's where we might take, uh, here's where a little bit of artistry might, uh, uh, might uh, be useful. Uh, let's, um, how do you want to cut out four and five? So cut out, oh, okay, so that means I'm going to use set difference. Sorry about this one second. Uh, so I'm going to remove, I want to take out. Now here's the question, how do you describe four and five? The intersections of T and A. Yeah, this is, if you look at where four and five are, that's the intersection of set T and A. So I'm going to remove that. So that gets rid of four, five. Okay. So now, um, how do I get rid of seven? Wouldn't it be minus all integers in A? Well, the problem is I, I can't write minus a because that would take out the entire thing. I don't want to get rid of, uh, I don't want to get rid of six. Uh, so let's For look. Or a adjacent, is that what it's called? What's that? Is it, I, I forgot the symbol. The, it, would it be the a adjacent? Oh. Um, uh, so, so, what, so what do you mean, what do you mean adjacent? Like all all sets in A that are not in C. Ah, so we want everything. Well, actually, actually, actually. Uh, 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 um, okay, so you want to, so you want to remove. Sorry. Ah, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, so you want to remove. So let's get rid of everything that's in A but not in C. Okay, that's actually a good description. Uh, so how do I? So so what is that in set notation? What is everything in A but not in C? Is it A complement? Uh, well, A complement is everything not in A. No, it's C complement. 
Uh, so C complement is everything not in C. Uh, okay, so so how do I get, how do I limit ourselves to just the things that are in A? So we want everything in A that's not in C. So we have, well, actually, let me ask the same question that we asked, uh, that I asked a little bit earlier. If you want everything in A that is not in C, is that an either or, or is it a both and? Both and. It's a both and, and it's, it's again one of these. So we want to remove everything in A. So it has to be in A and also not in C. And we should actually throw parentheses around that to, uh, uh, we should actually throw parentheses around that to, uh, to make it clear that we're going to remove this particular set A intersect C complement. So, uh, so, so here's one way that we can get six. Now, just as, a, just as an observation here, uh, there's actually several different ways we can isolate that set. And uh, there's not a unique answer to what that expression is. Uh, there's several different ways of describing the same set. Uh, so, here's, uh, so here's a different way of looking at that. So let's uh, reset. No pun intended. Uh, but if I reset, so again, I want this region six. So here's a uh, here's a different way I might look at that. Uh, if you wanted to cut six down from a larger region, so back here we took six as part of this big set A. So that's where we started here. We started with A and then we removed a whole bunch of things. Uh, if I want to remove six, if I want to cut six down from a small, from another set, uh, what's another set that I might, or what's another thing that I might cut six from? From C? Uh, I might cut it from C. Uh, actually, let's, actually what we might do, look at, this region right here. So one of the problems we have if we start with A is if I want to get six, I have to get rid of three pieces. So if I wanted to get six this way, I could start with A and then I could remove the three pieces that I need there. Uh, but if I start with this bit here, then I only need to remove one piece. So the question is, how would you describe this bit right there. How would you describe those things? Five and six together. Would it be both A and C, but both not A in B? and C? Yeah, so let's start with that. It's both A and C. So we'll start with that. Remember both and that's an intersect. So it's both A and C. So that gives us five and six together. Now, what do I want to, I don't want all of it. I need to remove, how remove, do I get rid of five? Remove T, no? I remove T. So, uh, so again, here's one way we can write that region. Uh, here's another way we can write the region. Again, you should probably include the parentheses there just to, uh, uh, just to, uh, just to uh, keep, everything, keep everything straight. So there's two answers, right? So uh, there's at least two answers. Uh, if you're creative, you could probably come up with several more answers to this. Um, uh, so, so yes, there's at least two answers here. There's actually an infinite. There's the, not an infinite number, but there's there's quite a few more answers that you could come up with. Uh, really, depending on how you look at the region. And again, the thing I would I would strongly emphasize here is, or the thing that makes this easier is think about this as scotch tape and scissors. If I want to make this region six, or really any region, how do I cut it down from a larger region or how do I glue it together uh, from a uh, from a from a from a uh, from smaller pieces uh, by the way if we had to glue regions together uh, how would we just how would we uh, what's our glue so so removing regions cutting regions out that corresponds to our set difference uh, what does gluing them together uh, taping them together mean in terms of our set uh, operations union that's a union, right? If I want two regions together, I'm going to scotch tape them together, and that's going to be a union. 
Okay. So now a related question here. So I'm going to zoom out just to be able to pick up the question up there. Yeah. So here's a here's a related question, a related type of question. Uh, by the way, if you want to get a screenshot of this, let me know, and I could I could zoom in and and focus in on it. Or we could do that afterwards. Uh, so, so here's a related question uh, that gives us a bunch of information about sets. Um, so I'm going to scroll up. Okay, so here we have 60 students and let's see, 41 like basketball, hockey, and like neither. And again, the reason that Venn diagrams are so useful is they're really good ways of, of organizing a whole bunch of information. Uh, so here uh, we have two sets, the, uh, the universal set, all the students surveyed, uh, the B set, they like base, uh, basketball, the H set, they like hockey. So there's two sets B and H, and then there's a universal set. So I draw a little MasterCard diagram. Um, okay, so let's think about this. So there's 60 students. So that means that there's 60 students. Sorry, would just mind zooming in a little bit? The words are very tiny. Ah, right, let me, they would all actually do that. Let me. How's that? Okay, so, yeah, there's 60, yeah. so there's 60 students in this universal set. Uh, so there's 60 students in our universal set. Um, so 41 students, uh, 41 students like basketball. Uh, now now here's, here's, here's a uh, strategy for thinking about this. Uh, I call this the twenty dollars strategy. Uh, before you write a definitive thing down, so so yeah, scrap, scratch, uh, scratch work is, is scratch work, and nobody pays attention to it. Uh, but before you write something down, are you willing to put twenty dollars on the table to guarantee that you're correct? Uh, so here, forty-one students like basketball. So, am I willing to say there's forty-one students in this region? Are you willing to put $20 that says there's 41 students in this particular space of our Venn diagram? No. No, why not? I mean, we know 41 students like basketball. Uh, so the thing is that when we write this 41 here, we are committing ourselves to there's 41 students who like basketball and none of them are in this region. I don't know if you can see that. So none of them are in this region between the two sets. But can I be, not a racer. Uh, can we have a student there? Is that a student who likes basketball? No. Well, they are in the set B, aren't they? Yeah. So they are a student who likes basketball, but they're not, the, they're not in this group of 41. So the idea is we don't know that there's 41 students in just this region. We don't know that there's 41 students just here. Uh, that 41 students is going to be distributed. Um, that 41 students is going to somehow be distributed among the group that is in this region, that's in this region, but also in this region in between the two sets. And similarly, uh, there's 28 students who like hockey, and we know that those students are either going to be in this set or they or in this part of the diagram, or maybe they're going to be over here. How about the students outside? What can you tell me about the students outside? They don't like either. They don't like either sport. Are you willing to put $20 on the table and tell me how many people are outside? No. Well, 
Well, you yeah. just told me they don't like either sport. That's what we, eight, right? Eight. What's that? Eight. We know there's eight, right? And and here, uh, here we know there's eight students who like neither sport. The only place that those eight students can be is they have to be outside. Okay, so they cannot be in the intersection. They basically. cannot be in the intersection because if they're in the intersection, they either like hockey or they like basketball or they like both. Okay, so we know, uh, so we can't really say yet how many students we have, uh, how many students we have in each of these circles, but we do know there's eight students who are entirely outside the circles. So we know there's eight students on the outside. Uh, what does that tell you about the students inside the uh, two circles together? So of the students that are in here. That they like either basketball or hockey. And how many of them are there? So you have to add up the total and then minus eight, right? Well, it's it, uh, actually easier than that. What do we know? There's 60 students altogether. 60 minus eight. It's 60 minus eight. There's 60 minus eight. There's 52 inside our two circles. I get it. It makes sense. OK, so now, well, we know there's 41 inside this circle. We know there's 28 inside that circle. So here's the part we couldn't figure out. Uh, how many are in the middle? Well, let's look at those numbers, 41 and 28. Um, we know there's 52 that are inside the two circles together. Um, given that we know there's 41 inside this circle, there's 28 inside that circle. Uh, what does that tell you about the group in the middle? So here's a useful strategy uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, um, approaching many problems in life uh, and also in mathematics. Uh, take an extreme position and see where it takes you. Uh, so in this case, if there's no one in the middle, so if there's nobody in this middle region, then what happens? Well, we have 41 people, uh, 41 students in the one set, 28 in the other, so that's 41 plus 28, and that's 69 students. If there's no one in the middle, then 41 students are in that first circle, 28 students are in the second, and then we'd have to have 69 students altogether. Uh, now, what does that tell you? 17 students are in the middle. Gotta have 17 in the middle. So there's 17 in the middle. That's the only way that we can uh, basically, I mean, you can look at it a couple of different ways. Uh, one way you can look at it is these 17 students are counted twice. Uh, they're counted in the 41 students who like basketball. They're also counted in the 28 students that like hockey. And so because they're counted twice, our numbers add up to too much, but the way we can reconcile that is that we drop out those 17 that are uh, that are in the middle. Let's uh, let's go ahead and redraw that diagram a little bit. I'm sorry, how did you get 17? Okay, so so if there was nobody in the middle, then we had to have a total of 69 students altogether uh, because there were 41 who liked basketball. There's 28 who liked hockey. And so if there is nobody in the middle, then that, for that group of 41 students is off here to one side, uh, the 28 students is off here to the other side, and there's nobody in the middle. And so this MasterCard diagram would represent 69 students altogether. Now, what we know, though, is that there can only be 52 students inside. And so that means there has to be some number of students in the middle. And where that 17 came from, which is because we knew there was 52 inside, this is 17 too many. So that's where that 17 came from. 
All right, so we know there's 17 students here. And let's go ahead and piece the rest of it together. I know there's 41 students inside this left circle. I know where 17 of them are. So that means there has to be 41 minus 17, what, 24. 24 have to be here. There's 17 students in the middle. I know that in the entire circle, there has to be 28 altogether. So there has to be 28 minus 17, there has to be 11 in that region. And so now, uh, once we have the picture, we could answer all of our questions. How many students liked exactly one of them? Well, we know that 24 liked basketball and didn't, uh, weren't hockey fans. Uh, we know that 11 liked hockey and were not basketball fans. And so, uh, so we know that uh, 24 plus 11, so that's gonna be what, 35 liked exactly one sport. Um, and then again here, once we have the diagram, this is the number that are not in the middle, that are not in B intersect H. So if we know there's 17 students in the middle, if we know there's 60 altogether, then outside has to be the remainder. That'll be, uh, let me see if I can write that. Uh, so we have 17 in the middle, so we have 60 minus 17 outside of B intersect H, B intersect H, yep. So that says the cardinality of B intersect H negation is gonna be 17. Okay, uh, questions on that one? I think okay. you mean 60 minus 17, right? Uh, si yeah, 60, yes, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. So, sorry, 60 minus 17, 43. Yeah, 43. <laughs> okay. Thank you, I think this is clear. What's that? I said, this is clear, thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at what's another one here. Da, da, da. Okay, all right, so uh, base conversions. Let's uh, talk a little bit about base conversions. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'll make one modification on this one. So I can tell you right out that that question there is not a type of question. Yeah, we, we've, we, we were asking the question in a different format now, uh, but uh, well, let's uh, so so this one, um, is okay so let's uh so let's think about how these uh, numbers are actually let me pull a let me pull a question from let me get a better question for this one uh the base conversion questions are um probably one of the ones that have the biggest difference between what's the printed sample exams and what the uh um what the final will look like so um Okay, so let me pull some. Uh, let me pull some somewhat more representative questions of the uh, of the. Uh,
Okay. So, uh, so, so here's a couple of a uh, couple of somewhat more representative questions, and then I'll and then I'll do the uh, the other question. Uh, but this is sort of to uh, set the stage for this. Uh, so, if we uh, if we want to convert, so remember the idea behind writing a number in any base is that what we're going to do is we're going to take our number and we're going to group by uh, whatever our base is. So if I'm working in base three, for example, then I'm going to form sets of three. And every time I get a set of three, it's a unit. Um, Excuse me. Uh, so one of the big ideas here is that a unit is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, one of the big ideas here is that arithmetic is bookkeeping. You're keeping track of how many of which units. So if I want to express a number in base three, so let's take a look at this. Here's one, two, three, one, two. So I can look at this. Uh, so a unit is either an individual object or it's a set of, in this case, three objects that I'm going to treat as a single thing. So here's a set of three. And so I'm going to record what I have. Uh, so I have one of these things and two leftovers. So, uh, so, so you can think about this as an intermediate stage for writing units. I have one of these and two of these and the way that I get my final notation is I leave out all of the uh, all of that information and I just record I have one of one type of unit I have two of the next type of unit and then because it's in base three I'll actually spell it out that way so there's my there's my answer in base three um, if I have more objects the bigger So, so let's take more objects. Uh, so again, I am working in base three. So I'm going to collect sets of three. So here's a set of three. Here's a set of three. Here's a set of three. Uh, I'll make this more interesting. I'll add in one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, here's another set of three. Here's another set of three. And then there's one thing left over. Okay, so now we might think about this as one, two, three, four, five. We might think about this as five of these and one of these. Uh, so that's the way we might start. Uh, but the thing to recognize is that the, uh, the finding sets of three extends to any set of three we can find. And so the thing you should notice here is here, we have another set of three. That's a set of three of these things. Wait, how do you have a remainder? Well, it's, it's whatever's left over. So, so here we have, here we have a bunch of things. And so I formed my set of three, but then I had two things. I couldn't, uh, I didn't have a set of three left over here. So I just had two of these things left over. So, so, so the idea is that is that is that we're get, you're starting with a bunch of objects, however many objects you have. So the idea is you form sets of, uh, you form your sets, uh, however you're going to form them. Uh, again, because we're working in base three, we're forming sets of three, and we may run out. We may we may we might have exactly the right number to form enough sets, or there may be one or two things, that, a couple of things left over that we can't fit into a full set. Uh, so that's the basic idea. We, ju we just start by forming our sets and then figuring out how many of those sets we have. Oh, and I apologize. I don't know if you saw, but um, someone in the group chat said that they're trying to get into the review, but they can't. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I, okay, Eileen, is Eileen here? Yeah, I think she. Yeah, I think she just got in. Yeah, I, I did. I did see her try to try to join in. So I thought. I think I added her. Ah, okay. So, uh, so here's the important thing. We do have this set of three of these objects. So again, arithmetic is bookkeeping. We have one of these things, and I'm just going to draw it that way. Uh, we have so that takes care of all of these. 
that takes care of all these. Uh, we have two of these things, those two, and one last leftover, and that's this last one over here. So again, our first step is we indicate we can draw out our units. We don't have to draw out our units, but uh, the first few times you do this, it's useful to do that. Uh, so we have, uh, so now we can record how many of which units is one of the big things, two of the medium, one of the small, and again, this is base three. And when we're writing numbers, this is all we're really doing. Uh, so when we work in base 10, uh, our sets that we're forming are sets of 10. So I take 10 of something and that gets me a single thing. Okay, so that's writing numbers. Now let's talk a little bit about doing arithmetic. Uh, so actually, so, um, so here's something else we might do. So once I have a number written in a particular base, I can go back to a base 10. You could think about these as, so to speak, ordinary numbers. Uh, so here, uh, this number one, one, four, four, and this is base five. So, uh, so in base five, let's see, where do I wanna write this? I'll, let me move this down. So if I want to figure out one, one, four, four in base five, so my units in base five, so the units in base five, the smallest is always gonna be a one. Uh, so the smallest unit, this is always a one. Because it's base five, then I my next size unit has five, so this is a five. Um, how big is the next size unit? Well, it's five of these. So how much is five fives? It's 25. It's gonna be 25. And so our number here, we have our smallest unit, one size up, one size bigger. We have to go one size bigger What's our next sized unit? That's, a, that's an even bigger one that I'm not gonna try to draw. And again, it's five of, it's five of these. So every unit is five of the preceding unit. So five fives, that gets 25. Five twenty-fives, how big is that? How much is five quarters? 125? It's $1.25, right? So, so these are the size of the units. So again, arithmetic is bookkeeping. When you write a number like this, we're saying we have one big one. That's this one. We have one large. We have four of these. And then we have four of our smallest units. So, well, think about this as making change. Base five is kind of convenient for us because we actually have coins, penny, nickel, quarter. Uh, we don't have a dollar twenty-five coin, but uh, uh, but that's that would be the extension to the next place up. And so, how much do we have? Well, this is one twenty-five. We have twenty-five. We have four nickels and four pennies. So that's 174. And so there's our number 174. So again, the, the idea you want to keep coming back to is arithmetic is bookkeeping. We're keeping track of how many of which units that we have. And the only real difference here is that our base tells us how big each of the units are relative to the next. So again, whatever our base is, each unit is that many times larger than the unit before it. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's extend that to doing arithmetic. But the answer would be 175 base 10, right? Uh, 174, uh, 174 base 10, yes.
Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so this yeah, so this would be our final answer. If I wanted to convert this into a number in base 10, uh, yeah, this is what I would want to do. Uh, just as a quick note, um, there's not any good reason you'd want to convert this to a number in base 10. Uh, what you really want to do, and that actually kind of goes to this type of question. And let me pull a let me pull an addition question as well. Uh, what you really want to do is um, is you want to be able to work with the uh, with the amount in in whatever base they have. So there we go. Let me pull an addition question first. The least efficient way of trying to do many of these problems is converting back into base uh, into into base ten and then doing the arithmetic in the usual way, uh, because part of the part of the problem is you do want to give the final answer in terms of whatever the base is. Uh, so here's a uh, here's a useful way we might uh, represent the units. So again, this is base five. Uh, so we have our smallest unit. We have five of these. And one way we often represent this uh, is we represent it as a rectangular block. It doesn't really matter what we represent it at, uh, but the idea is that uh, five of these make up one of those. And then oftentimes we represent, as you saw, I draw the, I, we, uh, we might represent a bigger unit this way. So this is five of these is one of those. So again, because we're working base five, five of any unit is the next larger unit. So this three, zero, two, base five, again, visually, you can think about it as we have three of these. None of the rectangles and two of the little squares. And then two, zero, one, base five, we have two squares, one of these. And so if I add them together, uh, so if I add them together, uh, what happens? Well, I have three of the squares, and then I have five These. I'll do this in two ways, by the way. Uh, so, um, so if I add them together, here's what I end up with. And the most important thing to recognize here is, again, because we're working in base five, anytime you have a set of five objects, you can treat that as a single thing. Uh, the, term, the term that we use for this is we can bundle and trade. Uh, we're going to bundle this set of five and trade it uh, for the next bigger thing. I'll represent it that way. So this set of five, we can bundle that up, we trade it and we get the next bigger thing. And so again, arithmetic is bookkeeping. We have one big thing. We have none of these. We have none of these. And we have one, two, three, we have three of these. And so our final answer, one, zero, zero, three, base five. So, uh, so, so again, uh, arithmetic is bookkeeping. We just want to keep track of how many of which units. Now, you don't have to draw everything out, uh, uh, so there's a couple ways you might organize this. Uh, one way you could organize this is uh, sometimes called a place value chart. And the important idea here is that we're going to separate out the different amounts. So again, you might, if you want to, you can think about these are small, these are medium, these are large. And so how many of the smalls do I have? I have three of the smalls. And again, that's what we got there. I have none of the mediums and I have five of the large, but now because I have five, uh, because I have five of the large, what I can do is I can bundle these up and trade them for one more 
of the, well, call them jumbo size. Uh, so I can bundle the five here and trade them for one more in the jumbo size. And so that's where I get my final answer, one, zero, zero, three, again, in base five. Um, this is a, yeah, so, so, so again, either way you want to approach this problem. Um, I like the visual the first couple of times that, that I do this just because uh, there are some tricky features about doing this. Uh, the most common mistake, by the way, if you do this, uh, the most common mistake is bundling. Uh, when you trade, remember that what you get ends up in the next column over. Uh, so the most common mistake here is bundling this five into one, but then leaving the one in the uh, in the column that you started with. Uh, once you trade it, it's gone, and then it's one more in the next place over. Uh, so, uh, so so question, questions on questions on that one on the on the addition there. No questions. Okay. Now, subtraction. Uh, subtraction is uh, is uh, follows something very similar. And again, we could think about subtraction as removal. So again, uh, again, I'll do this in two ways. We can. Uh, so again, now we're working in base four. So our units are one. We have four of these, and four of these. <coughs> So what I have is I have two, two, one, four. I want to remove two, three, four. So I have two big, two medium, one small, and I want to remove two medium and three small. Okay, so I can see that I can remove two medium because I do have two medium to remove. Um, I want to remove three small, <clears throat> but I only have one small that I can remove. So what, we, so what can we do? Well, we can break one of these up. Remember we have our exchange rate. <clears throat> we have our exchange rate. One of these, one big is, excuse me, one big is four medium and one medium is four small. So uh, what I can do is I can, uh, the term is unbundle. Uh, you might have, you might use the word borrow. Borrow is a terrible term. Borrow implies that you're going to get it back. Uh, you're never going to get it back. Uh, the idea is I'm going to unbundle this. I'm going to take this one apart. I'm going to take this apart. It's gone. It's, it's no longer there. It's never going to come back. So we were not going to call it borrowing, uh, but I can trade it for four, one, two, three, four of the smaller pieces. And now I have plenty of these medium I can remove. I still want to get some of the smalls I can remove. So again, I'm going to unbundle. I'm going to take one of these. I'll take this one and I'll break it apart. And my exchange rate says that I can break that into four of the smalls. So I can break that in. So if I get rid of it, if I trade it out, I get this amount. Now, this is still 221 base four. Uh, the only difference here uh, is that instead of having two of these and two of the medium and one of the small, um, I've basically made change. I've taken my $10 bill and I've broken it up into two fives. Um, do I still have the same amount? Yeah, it's still $10, but it's two fives instead of one ten. Uh, so the amount I have here hasn't changed at all. Uh, so I still have the same amount. Um, and so now I want to remove two and three. So at that point I can, and maybe I'll switch colors here just to... Uh, See if I can see that. So I'll remove one, two, and one, two, three. So there's my removal. And arithmetic is bookkeeping. So what do we have left? We have one big. We have one, two, three, medium. And we have one, two, we have two, small. And so the amount is one, three, two, 
phase four. So again, here's the uh, here's the uh, those of you who've taken uh, uh, one of the education pedagogy courses might uh, might refer to this. This is a uh, this is how we do this with tangibles. Uh, these are uh, cuisine uh, cuisine rods. I think are the uh, things that these are. And and again, what we're really doing is we're just saying I could take this big thing and I could break it apart. I can trade it for some number of the smaller pieces, and then I can remove things as I need to. And so I could get my computation. This is 132 base 4. Uh, if you want to do that using a place value chart, uh, so again, we have our 2, 2, 1. Uh, we want to remove 2, 3. So what we did with our, what we did here is we took one of these and we broke it apart. Uh, we still have one left, but now we have four in the uh, uh, four more of the mediums. We took one of our mediums and broke it apart, and we got uh, four in the next place over. And so now, again, arithmetic is bookkeeping. We have one, we didn't remove any. We had four, five, we removed two. We had five, we removed three. And so we get our final answer, same answer as before, 132 base 4. Um, again, you can either write it out tangibly using, you, or you can you basically use the uh, manipulatives, use the quiz in your rods uh, to, to, to perform that subtraction, or we can use the place value chart. Um, Again, I, I you know, again, if you, again the the drawing, I think the drawing helps the first couple of times you do this. It does take a little bit of time to get used to the place value chart. And again, very uh, the one thing to be careful with the place value chart is uh, arithmetic is bookkeeping. Uh, the most important thing to remember here is that when you trade things, you still have you still probably have things left in the place that you traded from. So here we started with two in this largest place, we broke one of them apart, but we still had one left. So we had one left and we got four more in the next place over. Okay, so questions on the, uh, the subtraction. No, thank you. Okay, so now let me zoom out to where was this one? That's that, that's that, that's that, and project show. And okay, so now. Okay, so now let's take a look at this. So without, so let's take a look at the first question. So again, here's a, uh, um, here's the, um, again, that problem, don't worry about that one. Uh, but uh, again, here's the subtraction, the difference here is we're using base 12. Uh, but here, okay, so let's think about the next two numbers in the sequence. So, um, one way you might look at this again, there's there's two ways you could approach this. Uh, this one I would think is almost easier if you actually draw the pictures out. So one one base four, uh, that's one. Not bad. That's one medium. One small. Two two base four. That's two mediums, and too small. One, one, zero, that's one large, one medium, not, and no small. And then let's see, two, zero, three, base four, that's too big, three small. All right, so let's think about this. Um, let's think about a rule that uh, converts, uh, that takes us through each of these steps. Okay, so what is one possibility? If I have this amount and I do something to get that amount, um, 
what's one thing I could have done to go from one to the next? You added one small and one medium? I could have added one small and one medium. Are you able to group them as well? Uh, yeah, I am able to group them as well. Um, that's interesting. I I was just thinking, like, what about grouping the medium size um, boxes? Well, we can't quite group the medium size because remember, this is base four, so we don't have quite enough to do that. Uh, I think there may be a typo in that problem. I think about that. That's. I think there's actually a typo on that problem because I don't know what, uh, I, I have no idea what that is supposed to get to. Let me, uh, let, me pull up, uh, let me pull up a different version of that one because that one seems to actually be wrong <laughs> or that one actually seems to be um, unanswerable within the context of, uh, of what you've done. Um, Here's a better one. Let's do a better one. Yeah, the problem is that sequence is not an arithmetic sequence, it's not a geometric sequence, it's not any sequence that uh, that we would have done. Uh, okay, so here, so here we actually have uh, an arithmetic sequence. Uh, so remember, an arithmetic sequence we form by adding the same thing every time. So our first two terms, three, two, five, and four, four, five. So again, um, if you draw it out, you might say, oh, okay, well, if I draw it out, then I can see what's been added. So here, what did we add to go from the first one to the next one? So one medium size and two small. Yeah. And one medium and two small. So again, we can see that we have three and two we have one more medium, we have two more small, and because it's an arithmetic sequence, then the next term, we're gonna add, again, one medium, two small. Now, what I'll do is I'll draw these out first, and then we'll figure out what they're going to be. So we have four, four, and then we're gonna add one more and two more. Okay, so that's what I would get. Now, if I wanted to write this as a number, uh, remember that we're working in, in this case, we're working in base five. So every time I see a set of five, I can group them as a single thing. Uh, so it's easiest if we start grouping with the smallest sets. So here I have this set of five here. So that's a set of five. So again, we're bundling and trading them. So when we do that, this is now gone, but now I have another medium. And just so it doesn't get lost, uh, we do have this one left over right there. So don't forget about that one. Uh, do I have any more sets of five? Yes, you have the five uh, medium. Yeah, I have the five mediums, one, two, three, four, five. So I can group all five of these mediums. And again, when I group them, they're gone and they've been replaced with a large. And so arithmetic is bookkeeping. This is one large, one medium, 
And again, don't forget, we uh, I drew this badly, but uh, uh, we have that one leftover piece in there, the one, one, one base five. So there's our next term is going to be one, one, one base five. And then I want the term after that. So again, I'm going to add, again, it's an arithmetic sequence. So I'm going to keep adding the same amount every time, one large, two small. And so what does that get me? Uh, again, what I start with is this. I'm going to add one large, two small. And I don't have fives that I can group. So this is just going to be uh, one of these, one big, two medium, three small. And there's my next term. And I can keep going from there. I can, I can keep adding terms if I wanted to. All right, uh, so questions on uh, the uh, arithmetic. Um, those, those are basically the type of base n, the base, base n arithmetic questions you should be able to do. Uh, any, anybody want to talk a little bit more about those or do we want to move on to uh, the, next, uh, the next topic? Can we try using subtraction if possible? Uh, sure. Uh, let's, okay, yeah, let's do another subtraction problem. How about, um, uh, let's see, how about two, one, one three, base five, and one S. Uh, about, uh, okay, so here's, a, so here's another subtraction. Uh, let's do two, one, three, base five, minus four, four, base five. So um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to use a place value chart? Well, we'll do both. Um, so if I do this with a with the actual object, so again, remember this is two of these, two big, one medium, three small. And I want to remove four of these and one. Okay, so I don't have enough medium or small to be able to remove them, so I have to break them up. So again, base five. So I'm going to break this one apart, and that gets me five. One, two, three, four, five of those. And let's see, I need four smalls, so I'll break one of these apart, and that gets me five smalls. One, two, Okay, so that's really just uh, prepping the uh, table, as it were, uh, for the things I need to get. At the, so I now actually am in a position where I could remove four medium, four small. So that's going to be, so I'll remove one, two, three, four of the medium, and one, two, three, four of the small. And arithmetic is bookkeeping. So what do I have left? I have one big, one medium, and three small. And that's one, one, three, base five. Um, I have a question. Uh -huh. Question that you did before with the arithmetic sequence. Yeah, um, this one. Our professor taught it like a totally different way. So I just wanted to see if we could go over it that way. Um, it's not using pictures at all. So it was like 44 minus 32, but there was no pictures being used. We kind of did it like a regular math problem. So it would okay. be like uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, yeah. So, what you're really doing here is uh, so. So the so what so again, it's an arithmetic sequence. So remember that when you're doing an arithmetic sequence, uh, the um, the you're always adding the same thing. So, what are we adding uh, to this to get this? So, uh, if you translate this into a number in base five, this is one of the medium, two of the small. Uh, so what we're doing is we're always adding one to base five. So um, yeah, so our arithmetic sequence, so it's three, two, base five, and then we add one, two, 
base five, and that gets us our four, four, base five. Okay, and then my next term, I'm gonna add one, two, base five. And so here's where that uh, having that place value chart can actually be uh, useful. Uh, so again, uh, that six of these, five of those, and I now can bundle and trade. So I have six in this, I'm gonna take five of them, that leaves me with one, uh, that leaves me with one, and then there's gonna be one more in the next place. And now I have a set of five, so I'm gonna take five of these, and that leaves me with one more in the next place. So there's my one, 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 base five. Thank you for going over it because we were learning that way. So yeah. it's, I like yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, straight. I mean, uh, this is more efficient once you get used to it. Um, but yeah, I, I like pictures. <laughs> I, I yeah, I like drawing things. Uh, so so I mean, this all this will yeah yeah. If you can if you can do it this way, this is actually this will be more efficient. Uh, and and certainly you do want to move towards towards being able to do it this way. Uh, the pictures help uh, the first couple of times you do it, so that they so that you don't have to. Uh, uh, the the trickiest part about the picture is remembering that when you trade something first of all it goes away and then you have uh, and then what you have ends up in the next column over and so that's one of the that's one of the uh things to be careful with if you're using the place value chart yeah I'm but uh, uh, but again certainly you want to yeah ideally you want to be able to move to not having to draw the picture every time because uh, certainly once the numbers get large or once the uh, number of places get large you really don't want to have to draw these things out professor yeah um, I'd like to do it on the exam, like with the place value chart, because I feel like I. That's like, it, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm nervous. I wouldn't have time to draw the pictures, but I'm confused. I'm wondering if you could explain it again as to why the um. Like the one goes stays and then moves over. Okay. So okay. So um. Okay, so probably the easiest way of doing that is to uh, so so remember this line came from back here. So here we had four of these and four of these, and then we added one, and we added two more. So if we just combine them. So if we just combine them, so there's our six. This is where that six came from. So, so and that was our, we have four, we have two, we put them together, we have six. So that's where that six is coming from. Uh, this five, that's from our four and one. So here's four, there's one more, we get a total of five. So that's where the five came from. Okay, so that's where we started with our five, six here. Okay, so now the next thing we did is we bundled them and, uh, and because this is base five, uh, we look for sets of five. And so here we have the set of five, right? So we combine that. Now, here's the important thing. Uh, when we combine that, that gets us uh, one of the medium sized pieces. Um, if you draw them out, it really doesn't matter where it is. Uh, if you draw them out, you can leave the medium sized piece in here. It's somewhat disorganized, but there's nothing, you know, it's still clear what we have. Uh, but the, the where it gets tricky to transition to the table is this isn't, uh, this medium thing is not one of the small things. So it's actually, um, it, it's, it should be over in this next place. So, so let's take a look at what we did there. So we had six, we bundled five, and that got us one more in the next place over. That's where this one came from. But when we bundled the five, there was still one of the small units left over. And so that's why we still had a one in that last, uh, in that last place. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so now, uh, so now we had, so again, we had the five that we had before. We had the five that we had before, and then the one more that we just created. And we said, oh, well, here's a set of five. I can bundle these together 
and to make one big. And again, if you're drawing them out, it doesn't really matter where we draw these, uh, but on the place value chart, this these big pieces have to be in the next column over. So that was, we took this five that we had, we bundled it and then we got one more and that's where that's coming from. Uh, that's where that one there is coming from. And so we have one more in this, uh, in this third place over. Uh, this one here, that was from the one that we created. So, so, that, was, uh, so that one is still there. And so that, that's where we get our final answer, one, one, one. I get it now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The tricky part about using the using the using the chart is remember always remember that when you bundle and trade, uh, what you bundle has to end up in the next column over. And the other thing is, it's all bookkeeping. So sometimes we are not able to bundle everything. Uh, we may have leftovers that stay behind because they don't get uh, they don't get bundled into a single package. Thank you. All right, so um, yeah, okay, so there's our subtraction. Um, let's see, that's not a good thing. Okay, all right, so other other questions you wanna go over on uh, base N arithmetic? Yeah, is it possible to do like an arithmetic pattern similar to that question, but with subtraction instead of addition? Um, it uh, you can uh, there 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 won't be a question where you have to do the subtraction, but it would really it would really be the same thing. Um, and and at that point, um, yeah, the the uh, yeah the arithmetic the arithmetic sequence and the and the uh, uh, the arithmetic sequence is really a question of just repeatedly adding the same thing. Uh, so yeah, so don't say yeah, don't worry don't worry about having to do a an arithmetic sequence where the numbers decrease. Okay, thank you. But I mean, if you had to, it would be the same thing, but you uh, but you won't have to do something like that. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me zoom out. Let me get. Uh, okay, where are we? We are way, way over here. So, wow. All right, so let's take a look at some of these other questions. Okay, so now some of these questions are really based around the idea of uh, when we when we when we do an arithmetic, uh, when we do an arithmetic computation, what we're actually doing is uh, uh, where there, there is a there is a significance to what we're doing. Uh, so um, so if we want to, so we have here we have seven and three quarters land for a uh, for a building project, and so. Okay, so um, let's see, seven and three quarters. So, uh, so we have two problems, and, and part, and the reason these are asked is they actually are very closely connected. Seven and three quarters, yeah, uh, two thirds of jar. So as you can probably guess, I like drawing pictures. So let's think about, so, so here's how, uh, so here's, uh, um, here's the, uh, here's what we might do here. Uh, so this is, I'm going to set aside one third of the land. I want to figure out how much is left. Um, well, let's think about that. I have a plot of land. So if I want to set aside one third of it, uh, so what I'm going to do, well, how, what, is, what does one third look like? How do I get one third? If this is the land that we bought, uh, how do you want to represent one third of that? What's the picture that you have in your mind for what one third looks like? Cut it in threes and shade in one. Got to cut it in three pieces. And I'm going to set aside one third and I really care about how much is left. So I'm going to basically get rid of that piece. Okay, so the idea here is that I'm looking at, at this plot of land. I've cut it into three equal pieces and I get rid of this piece. Uh, okay, so, and then the question is, I want to know how much is left. Um, so as a fraction, so 
So here's a question. Um, again, this question is asking how much is left. So uh, how much of what I have what I started with is left as a fraction. Don't worry about the computation yet, but just think about it in terms of how much we have. Well, if I got rid of one third, then what's the leftover part? Two thirds? It's gonna be two thirds. So it's two thirds of seven and three quarters. And, uh, Let's think about this as an arithmetic operation. How do we translate two thirds of an amount? You multiply. What uh, arithmetic operation does that correspond to? Geometric. It's a what? Geometric. Well, so arithmetic operation. So add, subtract, multiply, divide. When I say of, what do I mean? Five of three. Right. So I have five of three things. So how many do I have? So you subtract? Well, it is five of three. So if I have five of three. Multiply. multiply. That's a multiply, right? So, so usually when we talk about of, uh, that's a multiply. I have five packs of three candy bars. So I have five times three, I have 15 candy bars. That's a multiply. This is two thirds times seven and three quarters. Uh, and so we have this computation that will make whatever that numerical value is. So this first problem, uh, in order to answer that, the question we need to answer is what is two thirds times seven and three quarters? All right, now let's take a look at the second question. We have uh, uh, three quarters and we, the berries fill two thirds of the jar. So, well, I have my jar. What does two thirds look like? Two out of three shaded. Yeah, I'm going to take, I'm going to, again, I'll do the same sort of thing. I'll uh, divide this up into three pieces. That jar has an open top. And uh, two of those, two out of three are going to be shaded. And there's my seven and three quarters. So seven and three quarters is going to be that amount. So let's think about that. So if I wanted to figure out, so the question is how much does the, how much is the entire jar? Um, so give me a statement. So there are three terms, the jar, seven and three quarters and two thirds. Give me a statement that uses these three terms in some combination plus with some other words uh, possibly uh, that describes this situation here. Seven and three quarters. Okay, start with seven and three quarters. Okay, that uses that. What about the other two? So now incorporate the other two terms. So you want to give me a sentence, you know. Um, so, so here we said, you know, you know, what's left is two thirds of seven and three quarters. That was our statement that represented this situation. Uh, now we want a statement that represents this situation. And again, the terms we want to use, jar, seven and three quarters, two thirds. Well, so in the jar. Okay. 
So what's the relationship between seven and three quarters? So remember, this is our seven and three quarters. What's our relationship to the jar? Can you ask the question again? So, so what's what's our seven and three quarters? What is this, what is the relationship of seven and three quarters to the jar? How much is full? Well, it's it doesn't fill up the jar, but it's part of. I mean, it's partly filling the jar. Uh, so, so give me give me a sentence that relates seven and three quarters and the jar and potentially even somehow involves this two thirds. What could you do seven and three fourths jar of two thirds? I don't know, I'm trying. <laughs> jar, well, uh, so, um, so, so here's our jar. The idea is here's our jar. Here's our seven and three quarters. Let's throw in a verb. Is seven and three quarters the jar? Does seven and three quarters is the jar? Is that true? Isn't it part of the jar? It's part, how much? Seven and three fourths, no? Well, that's 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 the amount, but it's you just told me it's part of the jar. How yeah. much of the jar is it? Look at your picture, or again, so that you, so you know it's part of the jar. Uh, it, so so you know it's part of the jar. Um, it's two thirds of the jar. It's two thirds of the jar. It's two thirds. Oh, I get it. Okay. Of the jar. Now, give me a little more space there. So we have the picture, and if we if we if we know if we know that there are seven and three quarters, well, that's that fills up our jar to two thirds. Well, I can say that seven and three quarters is two thirds of the jar, and well, there's my uh, of again. So how do I translate that into mathematics uh, to a mathematical statement? Uh, well, that's seven and three quarters. How do you translate is? What is the mathematical symbol we associate with is? Equal? That's an equals, right? Yeah. If I say five is two plus three, you say, oh, well, five is equal to two plus three. So we say is, okay, so seven and three quarters equals two thirds of, well, there's our multiplication, whatever our jar is. And uh, well, remember our question, how much for the whole jar? So I have this statement, seven and three quarters. Well, that's two thirds of the jar. So if I wanted to know how much is in the jar, what do I have to do with that two thirds? Figure out what one third of the jar is. Well, I want well, I want the whole jar, right? I just want I want the jar. I want the whole jar. So, how do I get rid of this two thirds? What do I need to do? Add one third. Well, I can't add. Remember, that's a times. So, what happens? So, if I have a if I have an equation, five equals two times x. If I want to solve for x, what do I need to do with the two? You move it to the other side. How do you do that? Subtract it. Or no. Oh, you multiply both sides by that. I don't know. <laughs> divide. I have to divide. So uh, this is a times. So if I want to get rid of a times, I have to divide. So if I want to find the amount of the jar, because it's a times, I need to divide by the amount. 
and that's going to give me the amount that's in the jar. And so if I want to find the amount in the jar, I have to divide by two thirds. So, um, so again, there's a computational process that we use to compute what these are, but the more important idea here is that uh, is that if I want to if I want to find these amounts, I either need to multiply or divide, and that's really going to depend on the information that I have. Um, and let's see uh, some things to keep in mind here. Um, Probably the, probably, the, probably the most useful thing to keep in mind here is that if you, tell, if you have the pictures, if you have the pictures that represent the amounts that you have and what their relationship is, uh, then what you need to do becomes a lot easier to, becomes a lot easier to figure out uh, because it allows us, we can go from the picture to writing a statement. And often it's easier for us to translate that statement into a mathematical expression uh, than it is to go from the, uh, go from the question itself and go for the question itself and then into a mathematical statement. So the the idea here is that is that having those pictures are really is a really useful stepping stone to figuring out what needs to be uh, what needs to be done to solve a particular problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's just, you know, we've we really never worked on this before like this. So it's like, you know, a little bit of, you know, a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just. Yeah, you know, I here. So you know, let me let me say. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, slide this down. So here's. Uh, let me. So part of the idea here is the other idea that you really want to think about is. Um, all of our basic arithmetic operations, uh, they correspond to doing something. They correspond to uh, some sort of physical action you can take. So if I'm adding, uh, if I'm adding A plus B, you know, three plus four, what I'm doing is I'm taking two piles and I'm running them together. Right. So there's addition. If I'm subtracting uh, for minus one, what I'm doing is I'm taking something and then I'm going to remove an amount and I have something left. What happens when I multiply? What am I doing when I multiply? You have to turn it into an improper fraction. Well, that's that's what we're that's the that's the uh, that's the algorithm. But what is the the important question here is what is what picture do we have when we multiply things? When I say three times two, what type of thing am I looking at? What am I doing? You're multiplying two three times. I'm uh, adding. I'm taking. Yeah, I'm oh. taking two, but I'm taking three sets of two. So there's my, well, actually, that really is my three times two. Um, how about division? What am I doing when I'm taking 12 divided by four? When I find 12 divided by four, what am I doing? Well, here's 12, let me draw 12. So there's 12. What am I doing when I find 12 divided by four? I'm grouping four as many times. I'm, well, there's, actually, there's actually two things we do. Uh, part of the reason division is complicated is there's two ways we can look at any division. Uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, there really aren't too many variations. Uh, but one of the ways I can look at a division is if I want to find 12 divided by 4, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split off sets of 4. So there's a 4. 1, 2, 3. There's a 4. And there's a 4. And so I have 1, 2, 3. There's my three. So one of the things we do when we divide is we say, OK, I'm going to take pieces that are this size. I'm going to take pieces of size four, and I'm going to figure out how many sets of four 
we can make. Uh, now, the other way we can also look at this Uh, so, uh, again, part of the reason that division is the most difficult of the arithmetic operations is that there's two ways we can look at a division. Uh, and the way we usually introduce division is completely different from the way we usually do division. Uh, this, by the way, this is how we do division, right? Because what do you do? You say, well, 12 divided by 4. How many times, how many 4s can I make from a 12? And so I can make 1, 2, 3. Um, at this point, I usually make the observation, uh, our symbols for the arithmetic operations are no accident. There's our symbol for times. There's our symbol for plus. Why do they look alike? Part, well, uh, why do they look, uh, they, they look alike? Because we decide to make them look alike. But the reason that they, uh, they, uh, the reason that this particular notation is common is that when you write times this way, it's a reminder that every multiplication is really just a repeated addition. I take a bunch of twos and I add them together, and that's why we have our symbol for plus and our symbol for times looking alike. Here's our symbol for subtraction. Here's our symbol for division. Here's our other symbol for division. Uh, there's a reason these symbols look alike. When we divide, what do we often do? We say, well, how many times can I subtract this divisor from the amount that I have? And so here I can subtract four, one, two, three times, and there's my and there's my quotient. Uh, now we do introduce, we do talk about division in another way. What's another way that we can look at 12 divided by four? As a fraction? Well, as, as so, so what does it look like in our picture? So how do I show 12 divided by four in our picture? Divide 12 four times and then you get three? Well, so well, so so when you say divide four, divide twelve four times, what do you mean? So 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 again, or so so I so I have a thing, right? I have a, so that's a twelve. Okay, call that a twelve. So how should I show? How can I show twelve divided by four? Create four sections. I create the four sections. I break this. I go one, and maybe I do something like that. And so there's twelve divided by four. My whole thing is twelve. And I have divided it into four pieces. Um, this is, in fact, usually how we introduce division. We say, okay, I have a pie, I have a cake, and I have five people. No, I don't want to do five. I have six people coming mm -hmm. to the party, and I want to serve everybody a slice of cake. So I'm going to divide the cake badly. Um, I'm going to divide, that's terrible division. Uh, I'm going to divide the cake into six pieces. And so maybe I, my division looks something like that. And so I divide the cake into one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. And this is how we usually talk about division. So here we divide into four pieces and each piece Is three is three units. So so we can see we can think about division in two different ways. Either the divisor tells us how big each piece is, and the quotient is the number of pieces, or the divisor tells us how many pieces, and the quotient is how big each piece is. And again, we usually introduce division this way. We usually introduce division by saying, well, here, I've divided this into four. I've divided it into six. I've divided it into three or whatever. Uh, we usually introduce division by talking about dividing something into equal pieces. The problem is that when we actually compute divisions, this is what we do. Uh, when we actually compute divisions, this is what we do. We, uh, we pull out pieces of size, whatever the divisor is. 
So let's think about this problem. You have 55 eggs. Uh, so if I have 55 eggs and each cake requires eight eggs, well, let's think about that. How do you figure out, how would you figure out how many, uh, not, how would you figure out how many cakes you could make? Uh, 55 divided by eight or vice versa. Uh, well, it's one or the other, right? Uh, so is it 55 divided by eight or is it eight divided by 50? Well, what's the significance of eight? So I have a whole bunch of eggs. I'm not going to try to draw 55, but. Uh, Isn't eight the divisor? Eight's the divisor because each cake requires eight eggs. So I have this whole pile of eggs and I want to make a cake. So what do I do? Well, I peel off eight eggs and that's one cake. And then I peel off another eight eggs and that's another cake. And so what am I doing? Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm saying I have a whole bunch of things and I'm gonna sort them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna group sets of eight and each eight is gonna make one cake. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna tell me how many cakes I could make. It's gonna be 55 divided by eight. Now, um, we can write that as a division, but just as a note, um, we don't have to do the division because what are we really doing? I have 55 eggs, so I bake a cake. What does that do? Well, that takes up eight eggs. Can I make another cake? Do I have yeah. enough eggs left to make a cake? Yes. Yeah, sure, I'll make another cake. Yeah. But you'll have left over, I feel like. I'll have leftovers, yeah, and the and the idea is that the idea is that I'll keep going until I until I don't have until I can't make another cake, right? So I can I can do this division. So I'm really doing this division, but you can do that by just subtracting eight over and over again, and eventually we get down to uh, what happens. I think we have eventually we get down to a point where uh, we have a number of eggs. We peel off eight eggs and we have seven left over, and that's not enough. So that's not enough for a cake. Um, I'll do, let me just let me just do that really quickly. So here, fifty-five minus eight that leaves me forty-seven. I bake another cake. I bake another cake. I bake another cake. And another. And another. And that's where my seven is. How many cakes did I make? Now well, let's count them. Here's one. Two, three, four, five, six. So I made six cakes and I had seven eggs left over at the end. So for this answer, would you just have to write the expression itself and not solve it? Well, it depends on what the question is. I mean, I mean, as the question is worded, uh, as the question is worded, the the answer is fifty five divided by eight. Um, the question may actually say something like, you know, like, you know, how many cakes does, uh, you, know, you know, how many cakes does is she able to make? Um, so let's go ahead and finish that off there. So what, six cakes? Um, what can you, what what does that seven tell you? Isn't that what's they left over? That's what's left over. What's another word for what's left over? Remainder. remainder. That's our remainder. There's a reason that we use the words that we do for division. Uh, so, and the symbols. Again, the idea here is that when we do our division, uh, we're really doing a repeated subtraction. Uh, and so that's why our symbol for division looks a lot like a subtraction symbol, uh, because this is really saying, if you want to do this, the basic way you can do this, again, you don't really, yeah, this is, this is slow, uh, but, uh, but this is really, this is really what we are doing. Uh, we're subtracting eight as many times as we can. And it turns out we could subtract eight six times. And then we had some things left over. 
And so when we do this division, 55 divided by eight, well, it's six and we have this remainder, what's left over is going to be seven. Are we gonna have to use, like what would be a question they, that would be asked that we would need to write a remainder of seven? Or not really. It's just information to know. Well, I mean, it might. I mean, the question might just be to um, uh, let me think. Uh, how yeah? How many cakes can Amy bake? And uh, and how many eggs are? How many eggs does she have remaining, or something like that? Uh, or uh, you might even just say perform the perform the computation and express your answer as a quotient and remainder. Um, that would probably be the most direct way of, say, of saying it. Uh, so express your, so, so, so the, the computation we need is this one. And as a quotient and remainder, uh, our quotient is six, our remainder is seven. So would you write six remainder seven as the answer? Uh, yeah, if the, if the question were to actually compute the amount, uh, so, so again, the way that this question is worded, the expression is really 55 divided by eight is the expression that, right. yeah, that you want to evaluate. Uh, if you actually wanted to find out how many cakes, you would need to go ahead and do that division. Right, okay. Yeah, hey, and again, it, it, depends, it depends on how, that, how, the, how the question is specifically worded. Okay, we're not going to lose points like if we write remainder, obviously not six, like God forbid we don't write remainder or something, we might lose points, I feel like. Um, yeah, well, again, it depends on how the question is worded. So, so if the question does ask you to perform, to, to find the quotient and uh, uh, to, to do the division and give your answer in terms of a quotient and remainder, uh, you'd actually need to write oh. out, you know, you know, your quotient is six, your remainder is seven. That makes uh, sense. Uh -huh. Uh, just as a just as a note, um, yeah, yeah. So, so just to make one more connection here. Uh, so the other way we can do this. Uh, let me see what I can move here. Yeah, so almost this. So, so the other uh, connection that you want to make here. Uh, so, so this is six with remainder seven. And many of you want to also express this as a fraction. So here's an important idea here. Uh, so if I'm expressing this as a fraction, the idea uh, that is, uh, that's important here is that when I do a division, it is a frac uh, a division is equivalent to, not that, uh, a division is equivalent to a fraction where my dividend is the numerator and my divisor is the denominator. So this uh, 55 divided by eight, I can express that as the fraction 55 eighths. Um, by the way, uh, by the way, uh, how you speak influences how you think. Uh, always read fractions as numerator, denominators. So don't read this as 55 over eight. Uh, the reason that you don't want to read it as 55 over eight is you lose information. Uh, this is 55 eighths. And if you say 55 eighths, the reason that it's better to say that is this tells you you have a whole bunch of these things. Uh, arithmetic is bookkeeping, uh, how much of how many units. Uh, when I write this as a fraction, when I read this as 55 eighths, that tells me I have a whole bunch of, of eights. Um, and I have a whole bunch of these things. And part of the reason that's useful is um, What's that equal to? One. Why? Because it's one full piece, right? It's a whole piece, right? Because read what it says. This is eight. Eight. So that also be eight eighths? It's eight eighths, right? It's eight eighths. And the idea is that if I, again, if you think about what our eighths look like, and I can actually draw those. So eight eighths equals one whole, right? 
eight eighths equals one whole because the idea at eight is a piece that if I take eight of them, I get one whole. And so eight eighths, well, that's gonna be one. And so that's gonna be true in general. Wow, that's interesting. I've never learned this part like this, like visualizing it wise. Yeah, yeah. The visual, the visual, the visualization of this is real. Is really, is really very, very important. Um, how about sixteen eighths? Well, again, yeah. I have a whole bunch of these eights. Well, what do I know about the eights? Well, I know eight of them make one. So this is eight eights. One. And well, I have 16, I have eight more eights. Two. So this is two. So, so when, we, when we write fractions, again, the thing to remember is that the numerator tells you how many of whatever the pieces are. And so if you know how many, uh, in this case, if you know how many make up one, then when you have an improper fraction, you could say, okay, I can split off the amounts that I have. So if I have something like 13 eights, well, that's eight and five eights. So if I have something like 13 eights, that's, well, 13, well, that's eight and five, and these are eights. And I know that eight eights, well, that's one and five eights. eights. And I can write that as a mixed number, one and five eights. So there's your transition between improper fractions and mixed numbers. Uh, and it all goes back to the same basic idea that when we, uh, when we do arithmetic, we are keeping track of how much of what units. And all of arithmetic goes back to this bookkeeping. Uh, we're, we're keeping track of how many of which units, and sometimes we can trade them. So here, eight eights, we can trade eight eights for one. Um, and you know, if we don't have enough, we can't trade them because you know, we don't want to shortchange somebody. And so we have to express that as a fraction. Uh, so uh, just to kind of complete, the, uh, complete that idea here, uh, this goes into, well, remember what this said is we were able to get six full eights, sorry, uh, yeah, six, six full sets of eights, so that's six, and that remainder seven, well, if you think about that, that seven eights is what we have left. So this improper fraction uh, becomes the mixed number six and seven eights. And that mixed number, the easiest way of getting that mixed number is actually going to be from the quotient and remainder form of the uh, division. Mr. Suzuki, you'll be uploading this recording? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's see if there's something else that would be good. Ah. Okay. Let me check one thing here. Will we be like having a problem that uh, like involves LCM and GCF? Uh, potentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can pull one of those. Let me see if I can find a good one for that. And also, uh, Mr. Suzuki, we ah. need. I think most of the class needs help also with the Gauss method, if possible. Okay. All right. Let me see. LCMGCD.
Professor, if I could also request, um, I have problems with the repeating, um, excuse me, the repeating decimal ones where it's like, for example, like 0 0.7292929, 229 uh -huh, and then yeah. you have to like convert that. Okay, yeah, I, I could do something. While you were pulling questions, it'd be easier to tell you now. Okay, yeah, I could, yeah, I could do that one. That one's actually Thank pretty you. easy for me to. Okay, let's see. Are we going over this problem right now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get, uh, yeah, I'll go over that in a second. I just want to, I'm to pull a couple of other questions out of here that uh, would be. All right. Um, okay, there we go. All right. Okay, I seem to have lost that. Okay, all right. So, all right. So, I'll just make up, uh, make one up. Um, okay. So, let's take a look at this one. Uh, so, okay. So, um, so the local recreational league. Uh, blah blah blah. Uh, okay. So, we want to make sure that everyone's on a team. The teams are the same size, and each team has the same number of males and the same number of females. So, let's see. We have forty-two men. Okay, so so if we want to make uh, so if so let's think about that. So so we have our requirements of each team. Has the same number of men. Then. So if uh, so, so let's start off with this. If each team has the same number of men, then how many men could be on a team? Twenty-one. Okay, twenty-one. Any other numbers? Six or eight. Six, sure. Uh, or seven, I mean. I'm sorry. Or seven. Uh huh. Uh, any others? Two. Two. Uh -huh. Three. Three. And there's two that people always forget. Um, we could put all 42 men on one team and then could have one man on each team. Put that a little bit. And 14. Okay. 
Okay, are there any other possibilities? Um, I don't think so. Those are the, yeah. So again, you may want to think about that prime factorization 42. Uh, well, that's six times seven, seven is prime. Uh, and so two, three. So the ways that the, the divisors of 42, things that are formed by multiplying two, three, and seven. And these are the only possibility. There's also 14, but. 14? Ah, yes, good. Uh, good catch. So well, let's take the, each of these in steps. If I put 42 men on a team, how many teams would there be? One team. There'd be one team. Uh, if I put 21 people on a team, how many teams would there be? Two. Two. And 14 would be? Three. Three, six, seven, 14, 21, 42. Notice that that's just these numbers in reverse order. So, so, so I could so so I can make this number of teams. So, with sixty women, so how many teams could there be with sixty women? Fifteen. Okay, there could be fifteen. Uh, what are the possibilities? Two teams. It could be two teams. Three. Three. Um, six. Ten. Ten. Five. Yeah, there's five, twelve. 415. 415. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I hear somebody thinking about this in, in probably the easy way of thinking about this. Once you know one of the divisors, then you get the other one. So let's, let's, uh, let's try and let's try and list this out. So I could have one or 60. I could have two or 30. I could have three or 20, four or 15, um, five, or 12, six, or 10 teams. So I don't really need that. That's kind of miscellaneous information. Okay, so I can, so, so if, I, if, the, if the teams have the same number of men, uh, I can get any number of teams, I can get any of these numbers of teams, I can get any of these numbers of teams. Um, uh, so, So here's a question. Um, we want to make sure that the teams are the same size. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody gets on a team. So let's think about that. Um, if we make 10 teams, so let's think about this. If we make 10 teams, So there are 60 women. So with 10 teams, there's gonna be six women on each team. And again, that fits our requirement. Everybody's on a team and there's the same number of women on each team. What about the 42 men? If I make 10 teams, what happens? There's people left over. There's people left over. Uh, I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't make ten teams and distribute the forty-two men equally among all those teams. If I want to make sure everybody plays, then some of the teams have more men than others. Uh, if I want to make sure that all the teams have the same number of men, then some men don't get to play. So I can't make ten teams.
All right. So, um, so what seems to be the requirement here then? If I want to make sure everybody plays, I want to make sure that all the teams have the same number of men and also have the same number of women. Uh, what, what am I looking for? A common denominator. I'm looking for a common, actually a common divisor. Uh, I'm looking Sorry. for a number that's in both lists. Right? 10, I can divide 60 women among 10 teams but I can't make 10 teams with the 42 men. I can make seven teams with the 42 men, but seven isn't on this list, which means if I try to do seven teams with the 60 women, again, we run into the same situation. Either some of them don't get to play or some teams have more women than other teams. So, So let's uh, break this into two pieces here. Yeah, we can meet. So let's think about that. So these are the number of teams I can make that uh, will meet the requirements. All men play, they're the same number of men on each team. These are the number of teams I can make with the requirement that all women play and they're the same number of women on each team. Uh, if a number's on both, so one is on both. If I make one team, all men play, there's the same number of men on each team. And because it's on this list, all women play and there's an equal number on each team. Okay, can I make more teams? Is there another situation where the requirements are met? Well, what if I make two teams? Can, with two teams, will all women play and will they will all teams have the same number of women? Well, let's sit down the list of possible teams. Well, if I have two teams, then it is one of our possibilities. With two teams, all women can play, all teams have the same number of women. If I have two teams, will all the men be able to play and have all teams have the same number of men? Yeah. Yeah, because two is on this list as well. So I could do two teams, right? Can I do another number of teams? Can I do three teams? Yeah, because it's on the list. Yeah, three is on, well, three is on both lists. And that's the important thing. Three is on both lists. It's on this list. So I know that I could get all women to play and all teams have the same number of women. It's on this list. So I know that I can get all men to play and all teams have the same number of men. How about four teams? Can I make four teams? No. No, it's on this list. So... I could get all the women to play and have all teams have the same number of women, but it's not on this list. If I try to make four teams, either some men won't be able to play or some teams will have different numbers of men. Uh, what's the next larger team I could make? Uh, next, next larger number of teams I can make? Six. Six. Four. Uh, well, I can't oh, no, make I'm four. Sorry. Yeah, four. Not yeah. four. I meant six. Uh, I'm sorry. And is there any larger number? 
No. No. So in fact, and there's nothing, there's no larger number. So six is largest number. So if there's six teams, so let's now tie everything together. If there's six teams, so how many women are in each team? There's 60 women altogether. So there's going to be 10. 10 in each. Women. And how many men? There's 42 men. Seven. There's seven men. And so an answer to, so the first question, the largest number of teams, we can make at most six teams that meet those requirements. And so there's 17 people on each. Mr. Suzuki, these are multiples, considered multiples, right? These are actually divisors. So, so where we get these numbers from, these numbers here, these uh, numbers are all divisors of 42. Okay. These are all divisors of 60. And uh, what is six? It's a divisor of both. Right. It's a common divisor. And so, so one, two, and three, one, two, three, and six are all divisors. Uh, sorry, one, two, three, and six are all common divisors. What's special about six? It's the largest one. It's the largest of the common divisors. This is actually the greatest common divisor. Okay, this makes sense. And this is, this is the idea behind the GCD. I have, uh, so the idea in general is I have a bunch of divisors. I have a bunch of divisors. Uh, and there are situations where I want to look at the, uh, I would look at the divisor, the largest divisor that shows up in both lists of, in both sets. So I want to find the greatest common divisor. Okay. Now uh, the, um, so let's see. Okay, so so there's so there's our greatest common divisor. Uh, now the difficult thing here is that when we uh, when we look for the greatest common divisor of two numbers, uh, this is actually well, uh, this is an easy problem, but not the way we usually do it. Uh, so if I pick two numbers, uh, finding the greatest common divisor. Frequently, we talk about factoring. Uh, factoring is actually the hardest easy problem in mathematics. Uh, it's easy in the sense of it's easy to describe uh, how to what we're trying to do. We're trying to find two numbers that multiply to a number. Uh, it's hard because it's actually very hard to do. Um, So if I try to factor something like that, that's actually a difficult problem. Uh, but uh, but uh, we can find the greatest common divisor uh, using something called the Euclidean algorithm. And I'll say a few things about this. This, uh, uh, this uh, if you haven't, uh, the, the, this one, this, the Euclidean algorithm takes a little bit more, a little bit more time to go into. But, uh, uh, but here's a quick version of the Euclidean algorithm. Uh, if I have a number that divides both A and B, it also divides. A plus or minus B. Uh, so, so it also divides uh, A plus or minus B. And what this means is that, uh, so here's the uh, short version of the Euclidean algorithm. And the idea here is we can find candidates for the greatest common divisor this way. So 
So here's an example. If I want to find the greatest common divisor of uh, 75 and 85, uh, the thought process here is whatever it is, it must divide the sum and difference. Uh, now in practical terms, we want to look at the difference because that gives us a smaller number to deal with. It has to divide 10. So what are things that divide 10? Two and five. Uh, two, five, and don't, don't forget one as well, two, five, and then 10 itself. Mm -hmm. So, so, so here is your, so here is the, here is the, here is where we can, uh, here is where we can uh, use the Euclidean algorithm effectively. Whatever the greatest common divisor is, it must be one of these numbers. So what's the largest of these numbers that divide both of these numbers? Five. Five. And there's your GCD. So let me uh, let me let me write up one. That's uh, let me find one that's to come up with that number here. So for example, let's take a look at something like this one. Uh, you do not want to try and factor these numbers. I mean, you can factor them eventually, but it'll take a lot of effort. Uh, but whatever it is, must divide nine oh one minus three ninety one. What is that? Ten five four five hundred. No, that's all right. You should do the arithmetic correctly. So whatever the greatest common divisor is, it must divide 510. So what we could do is we could go and say, well, things that divide 510. So we could find a list of things that divide 510. And there, and we could find a list without too much difficulty. Uh, but. Uh, So there's a strategy in life and in mathematics that I call lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, once we do something, we can do this as many times as we need to. Uh, if I want to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers, it has to divide their difference. But now, whatever that greatest common divisor is, it's got to divide 391, 901, and 510. So it has to divide any difference that I want. And the difference that I want to take advantage of is this one, 510 minus 391. Yeah. 
Okay. So my greatest common divisor of these two numbers also has to divide 510, also has to divide 119. So any number on the board, any number on the board, pick two of them and subtract. Which two do we want to subtract? 901 minus 510. Well, 901 minus 510 just shuttles us back to 391. So we don't want to subtract those two because that just takes us back to a number that we have. Uh, our goal really is we want to get small numbers. It is easier to find things that divide a small number than it is to find things that divide a large number. So which numbers will give us the smallest difference? 391 and 119. Yeah, I could do 391 and 119. Made a mistake there someplace. Three ninety one and three ninety one. Make a mistake of that. Let me see something here. Oh, it's two seventy two, right? What's that? Is it two seventy two? I might be wrong. Hold on, let me make sure. No, you're right. Uh, two seventy two. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, that's okay. That's that. Okay. I was, I was worried there because I was not getting, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was not getting an answer that I expected. Yep. 272. Yep. There we go. Um, that has a lot of factors. So subtract two numbers, give me another number. Any number on the board, any number on the board. Uh, what, which two do you want to subtract? 272, 119? Yeah, I would probably go 272 minus 119. Again, the goal here is we want to get as small a number as possible. So what is that? That's going to be 3, 5, and 153? Yeah, 153. Um, can we get smaller numbers? 153 and 119. OK. And that's small enough that we can actually find the factors. What divides 34? Well, 1. Don't forget 1. 34. What else? 2. 2 and 17. So. Our greatest common divisor, and so let's go back to go back to our original question. Our greatest common divisor, three ninety one and nine hundred one, So again, the idea that all this comes back to this idea that if I have uh, if I have a number that divides two other numbers, it's got to divide their sum or difference. And again, typically the useful thing to look at is their difference because that will get us to smaller. Uh, that'll get us to smaller numbers. So if I want to find the greatest common divisor of these two, I find their difference. The insight that makes this work is that now I have three numbers that my divisor has to work on. And so any two, I can subtract and find their difference. So I just keep subtracting numbers that I get until I get something that I feel like factoring. In this case, that's 34. So here's my list of possibilities. Uh, which, of these you, which of these can you know immediately are not going to be divisors?
17. Well, uh, the 17 is not a divisor? Two. Yeah, you know two is not a divisor because these are odd numbers. Those are odd numbers, you know two isn't gonna work. And if, and same reason 34 can't work either because again, uh, if a number has 34 as a divisor, it's gotta be even. Uh, 17 may work. Now here's the, here is the one important thing that we do have to verify. Uh, we do have to check to make sure that, uh, that this does work. If this doesn't work, the only choice is the only la the only choice is going to be one, and so we check, and we find that in fact that does work. Three ninety one is in fact seventeen times I think it's twenty three, and nine hundred one is seventeen times fifty three. So. So it turns out that uh, 17 will be our greatest common divisor. And again, the, 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 uh, the, the, the key idea here, uh, again, the key idea here is that what I can do is I can keep doing subtractions. I can keep subtracting the numbers that I get until I get to a number that's small enough where I feel comfortable factoring it. Um, the other possibility is I may get to a number that's equal to one, at which point I know that the greatest common divisor has to be something that divides one. Uh, and in fact, that... Uh, So greatest common divisor of these two numbers, uh, again, whatever it is, it must divide has to divide two. So what are the things that divide two? Two. One, always. Uh, can it be two? No. Nope. Those are odd numbers. Can't be two. So greatest common divisor is one. And we got that without having to without having to try to factor these two numbers. And generally speaking, if you want to find the greatest common divisor of two randomly chosen numbers, uh, this Euclidean algorithm is actually the only really effective way of, uh, the only really efficient way of solving it. Okay, so, um, okay, so somebody asked about the, uh, about Gauss's method. Uh, so let me, let me pull up, a, let me do a problem with Gauss's method. Thank you, Mr. Suzuki. Okay, so, and so Gauss's method, uh, let's see if I Oh, and then a uh, and then somebody was asking about uh, converting uh, repeating decimal. So yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so a um, little bit of background on this. Gauss's method is based on and, and Gauss's method and repeating decimals actually have a certain similarity that I'll point out. Um, so Gauss's method is based on the following idea. Um, so here's the uh, problem. Let's say I want to add the numbers. So here's the basic idea behind Gauss's method. If I want to add the numbers from one to a hundred, I'm going to do two things. Uh, the first thing I do is actually an important connection to make with the repeating decimal. Uh, what I can do is I can say, well, this is, I don't know what this is, but I can at least give it a name. I'll call it S. And Gauss's method is based on the following idea. Um, 
if I reverse the order of the sum, uh, first of all, does reversing the order change the value? No. No, it's still going to be S. So the value is still going to be S. And here's the important insight here. If I add these two things together, if I add vertically, what do I get? This is 101 plus 101 plus 101. And the important insight here is that if I add vertically, all of those things add to 101, what's on the right-hand side? Arithmetic is bookkeeping. I have an S plus an S. I have two S's. So you can't do S to the second power, right? No, because remember S to the second, well, that really means S times S. Oh, yeah, this is right. really S plus S. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's two S. So, well, that doesn't do us any good. We have to add 101 a whole bunch of times. That isn't significantly easier, uh, but what does make it easier? What do I call a bunch of things added, a bunch of the same things added together? What is that? Let's take a smaller example. What's five plus five plus five? What's another name for that? What happens when I add the same number to itself over and over again? What am I doing? What, what arithmetic operation am I doing? I did that a little earlier than it was. Remember that is a, where did we put that? That was, uh, where am I on this? Uh, ah, here we go. Remember all of our, all of our arithmetic operations correspond to doing something. So when I'm adding, I'm putting combining sets. When I'm subtracting, I'm removing sets. When I'm multiplying, what am I doing? I'm adding sets of the same size. So if I have three twos, that's the same as three times two. So here, down here. So here I'm adding together a whole bunch of 101s. So there's a multiplication here. And so I'm adding together 101s. Now here's the important question. How many 101s do we have? Six. Well, I've written six, but I have not really, we've got to add all the numbers from one to 101. So how many 101s do we actually have here? A hundred. There's a hundred. Uh, the easy way of seeing that is every column gets you 101. So here's the first 101. Here's the second 101. Here's the third. And we don't write a whole bunch in the middle. Here's the 98th, the 99th, and the 100th, 101. So 
importantly, when we have a repeated sum, that is a multiplication. So this sum of a whole bunch of 101s, well, that's really 100 times 101. And that's equal to 2s. And now I want to solve for s. So what do I need to do to solve for s? Well, it's two times. So how do I get rid of a times? So remember, if you want to get rid of multiplication, we can divide by two. We divide by two. And so S is 100 times 101 divided by two. And that's equal to whatever number we get. That's 5,050. OK, so this is the basic idea behind Gauss's method. If I, if I, so, so the two things you really want to take away from this, I'm going to give the sum a name. I'm going to call it something so I can work with it algebraically. And if I reverse, if I reverse the sum ends, then when I add them vertically, they all add to the same thing. And this sum is some number of whatever they are. And then I just have to figure out what they are. So let's take a look at this problem then. Okay, so we want, uh, so let's see, what are we doing? We're doing 60 in the first month plus six more, that's 66 plus 72 plus, uh, wow, that's a long time, 15 years. So each month, so that's 15 times 12, that's 180 months. So let's see, this is the first month, here's our second, here's our third. Oops. So I need that 180th month. So how much do I make in the 180th month? Well, let's think about that. What are we doing? We're adding six each month. Here's a uh, Kind of a useful thing to uh, to uh, keep in mind in many problems. Uh, it's sometimes useful not to do the arithmetic. So here in my first month at 60, my second month I add six, my third month I add six, my next month I add six. The next month I add six and so on. What am I doing here? I'm adding the same thing over and over again. So what is that? That's a multiplication, right? So this is really 60 plus four sixes. This is really 60 plus three sixes. This is really 60 plus two sixes, 60 plus one six. And that's just gonna be 60, I'll move those over. Now, one thing that'll also help, let's try to be consistent. Um, every other one of these is 60 plus some number of sixes. Well, this first one is 60 plus how many sixes? None. Zero sixes. And the reason that that's useful is if we go back to, if we go back to here, this is 60, oops. So remember how this worked out. This was 60 plus zero sixes. This is 60 plus one six. This is 60 plus 
two sixes, uh, what's going to be in our 180th month? Well, it's 60 plus how many sixes? One hundred and seventy. Yeah, somebody said one hundred seventy-nine. Right? Because look at our third month, we add two sixes. Our second month, we add one six. It's always one less than the month number. So it's one hundred and seventy-nine sixes, and that works out to be what? That's uh, one eleven thirty-four. And there's our sum. So this is what we're trying. So, so actually, that answers that first question, how much uh, in the last month. So that's going to be 1134. And then if I want to look at the total savings, again, Gauss's method works because we can reverse the order. Uh, remember, the month before, we have one less six. So that's 1, 1, 2, 8, plus 1, 1, 2, 2, plus, yeah, et cetera, all the way down to 60. Still the same sum. Still 2s, 2s. That's still going to give us the same sum. And again, this is a whole bunch of 1194s added together. So that's a multiplication. And how many do we have? Here's our first one. Here's our second one. Here's our third one. So which one is that one? Someone put it in the chat, 180. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing the chat. OK, uh, so 180. There, yeah, there's 180 of them. Oh, there it is. OK, uh, so there's 180 of them. So there's our 180, and that's going to be 2s. And so s, I'm going to divide everything by 2. And so there's our total amount that we are able to save over that. So I, I, um, I did the, the formal Gauss's method. Then I sort of gave them the formula. Uh -huh. um, so I said the beginning term is B, the ending term is E. And then it's going to be B plus E times the number of terms divided by two. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's how I introduced it after I did the formal, formal um, exposition of the Gauss formula. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's yeah. So that's really yeah. So if you look at what if you take this uh, if you take this uh, apart. So the, yeah. So the so the other way you can look at Gauss's method. It's really the first plus the last times the number of terms divided by two. So if you take this equation, sorry. If you take this expression, uh, so we have 180 terms divided by two, and we're going to multiply first plus the last. 1134. So, so, th so, yeah, so there's where our 1194 is coming from, and then our 180 divided by 2 is coming from that, that quotient. Okay, so with repeating decimals, we almost have the same sort. We, uh, we have something very similar going on with uh, converting a repeating decimal into a fraction. So, if I want to convert the, well, let's take a fraction like 0. Uh, I don't know, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 repeating. Uh, so the idea here is that I'm going to say, I'm going to call s to be 0 0.121212 repeating. And uh, my recommendation on this is that if you're dealing with a repeating decimal, uh, it's convenient to write down at least three repetitions of it just to, just to sort of get a sense of, uh, of, of, what, uh, of how it works. Um, actually, let me try. Let me do two different ones here. How about um, 
Let's try it as zero point two two two. Okay, so the the key idea here is what happens if I multiply s by ten. So if I multiply something by 10, that shifts the decimal over one place. So if I multiply s by 10, 10s, that decimal shifts over one place. And again, because it's a repeating decimal, all that happens is those twos fill in. Now, Now, um, what you can think about as the, what I think about as the troublesome part of the, uh, of the repeating decimal is all this stuff. It's the, it's the repeating part of the repeating decimal. That's the, uh, that's the problem. I wanna get rid of that stuff. And the thing to recognize here is if I subtract over on the right-hand side, because the repeating decimals line up, they'll go away. I am left with just the integer portion. Uh, what do I have on the left-hand side? Arithmetic is bookkeeping. Algebra, something that we haven't talked about, but algebra is generalized arithmetic. Uh, the way you want to think about any sort of algebraic expression is that uh, is that algebra is just a generalized uh, is a generalized arithmetic. So, um, what do I have? I have ten s's. I'm going to remove one S. So what do I have left? 10 S. Well, I have Nine. 10 S. I took away, I removed one of them. So what do I have left? Nine S. I have nine S's, right? So algebra is generalized arithmetic. So I had 10. I took away one. I have one. I have nine left over. They're still S's. They, they're still whatever the S is. Um, and now I want to solve for S. So now I can divide both sides by nine. So that gets me S is equal to two ninths. And there's my expression. So what about something like, sorry, what about something like this one? Now the important thing to uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is don't get caught up in the steps. Focus on the goal. Um, so the obvious thing to try here is yeah, I multiply by ten. That shifts the decimal one place, and I subtract. I get nine s is equal to. Uh, the problem here is that our digits don't line up. And while we can do the subtraction, it's kind of a mess. Uh, it's, it's not a non-repeating decimal. So I don't want to multiply by 10. I don't want to do that. Um, what do I want to do instead? Again, what makes this work is that we're able to line up the digits. So what do I want to multiply by? A hundred. I want to multiply by a hundred. If I multiply by a hundred, that shifts the decimal two places and I get one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and so on. And so again, we can do the same thing now. And so I have a hundred S's, I subtract one of them. And what do I have left? 99. 99. My repeating decimals line up, so they're all gone. I'm left with 12. And so S is 12 99ths. And we probably want to reduce this. 12 is 3 times 4. 99 is 3 times 33. So I can remove that common factor and get a final answer for 30 thirds. Professor? Yeah. What if it's like um, seven, one, two, one, two, one, two, like where you have to get rid of that first number? Ah, okay, good question. Uh, so let's see, how, seven, one, two. Uh, 
Well, let's try it out, see what happens. Uh, so it's 0 0.7, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So again, we'll call this S. OK, so, so let's start off with what can we, what do we want to multiply this by so that our repeating part will line up? Well, do you want to remove the seven first thing you just do 10 or do you want to do all three numbers and do a thousand? That's what I'm confused on. Well, okay. So let's, let's look at that. If we multiply by a thousand, let's try that. So if we multiply by a thousand, that shifts our decimal over three places. So that gets seven, one, two, point one, two, one, two, one, two, and so on. And the thing that you'll notice here is that our repeating portion doesn't line up. Uh, we have twos and ones that are offset. Um, and if we multiply by 10, we run into the same problem. Uh, what if I multiply by 100? So if I multiply by 100, will that work? Well, it won't no. completely eliminate it, but it almost works because look at the last portion there. All of those line up. So if I'd actually do that, um, everything past that point drops out. And well, I do have, I still have a decimal here, but the nice thing is it's not a repeating decimal. Like that. And I could still solve for S. End up with that. Now, here's a question. Um, two questions. Is that an answer? Does this express our original repeating decimal as a fraction. Well, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, we, we typically, I mean, uh, typically we'd like our fractions to be quotients of whole numbers, uh, but certainly we've gotten to a point, we've gotten to a point where at the very least, at the very least, we no longer have this repeating decimal. Uh, so at least we have taken a step in the right direction. Uh, it's no longer a repeating decimal. Uh, now we like our fractions typically to be whole numbers. So here's a question. I don't really like having a decimal in my numerator or denominator for that matter. Uh, so is there something we can do to change it, to get rid of that, of that decimal? My, goal, my ultimate goal here is I would really kind of like to have a quotient of whole numbers. Uh, so is there something I can do that will allow me to no longer have a decimal anyplace? Well, what are things we can do to fractions? If I have a fraction, I can remove a common factor, but Anything I do in mathematics, I can generally reverse. I can also include a common factor. Uh, we usually say that we can multiply numerator and denominator by the same number. So can I, is there something I can multiply this by that will get rid of the decimal? What's the easiest thing to multiply by that will get rid of a decimal? So I have a number like 5.3 times something. And what I want is something that I don't, I no longer have a decimal ten? place. I can multiply by what? Did you say 10? Yeah, I could multiply by 10, sure. If I multiply a decimal by 10, that shifts the decimal over one place. And uh, depending on how far I need to move it, that might get rid of the decimal. So this is also the same thing as I can multiply the numerator by 10 as long as I also multiply the denominator by 10. 705 divided by 900, 
behind you. And then you just um, get the simplest form if uh -huh. it asks. Yeah, and then yeah. At this, at this point, yeah. At this point, we see that uh, numerator and denominator both have a factor of five, so we can remove that. That's uh, 140 mobile. In, in any case, would you, with the repeating decimals, would you always have to multiply by a hundred to get the s away, or or no? Well, yeah, well, yeah. It's it's a power of ten. So sometimes we multiply by ten. So in the first thing we in the first case we did, we multiply by ten, and that's because our repeat ten, the digits that we're repeating, uh, it was a single digit that was repeating. Uh, so here in the in the second example, in the second example, oh, sorry. Whoa, what just happened there? There we go. In our second example, uh, the repetend, the digits that were repeating, there was a two digit repetend, and so we multiplied by 100. And here, Again, uh, we had the so we had this leading seven, which was different, uh, but then the repeating portion was a two digit number, so it was convenient to multiply by by 100. And so, uh, so the what we multiply by is governed by how many digits we have in the rapid end. Um, so uh, yeah, so here, if we have that, if we have a non-repeating portion at the beginning, um, you can, I mean, there's two ways of handling this. Um, you can split it off at the beginning and then deal with a, uh, deal with, uh, uh, deal with a, um, um, just the repeating digits, or you can just include it and then, and then, and then you'll, you will end up with a uh, fraction where we have a terminating decimal as the numerator. And at that point, we can get rid of the decimal by multiplying by a power of 10. So either way works. Um, personally, I, I, I like doing it this way better because uh, otherwise the, the alternative there is that this decimal portion, uh, this is going to be, uh, it's, you have to convert that, that'll be seven tenths plus an amount. And then at some point, uh, at that some point, you, uh, you would need to deal with that seven tenths. Uh, why can't you submit it with a decimal on top? Um, it uh, depends on the question, but typically this type of problem you want to, um, write it as a fraction reduced to lowest terms. So what that means is that we do need to have it, uh, we do need to write it as a fraction where both numerator and denominator are whole numbers. And so we're not, uh, because of the form that we're supposed to write our answer in, uh, we do need those to be, uh, to be whole numbers. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see. Okay, so does that does that uh, does that help out on on terminating decimals and so on? Let me see. Let me think if there's anything else. Yeah. Uh, so so it's uh, so we've been here about what three hours now. So um, so uh, are there other questions that? Uh, so, I'd, so I'd like to finish off soon. But uh, uh, but if there are other questions that people want to go over, or if there's any other uh, topics that you'd like to talk about, um, I can I can I can I can spend a little bit more time here. Ah, okay, surface area volumes. Okay, yeah. All right. All right, so um, pull up the surface area volume. Professor, can we also do a problem um, where we have to find the nth term? Okay. Yeah. So the nth term. Uh, yeah. So that was basically like this, uh, like the uh, of ga uh, the uh, Gauss's method. So here, so this one, we were actually finding the uh, nth term of the of this arithmetic sequence, and so so again, the idea here is uh, uh, the most important thing here is identifying that what we're actually doing when we add the same thing repeatedly uh, does correspond to uh, a multiplication expression. So finding the nth term of a sequence really is 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 going to be is going to be something like this. 
uh, unless okay. there's a how, different. How would the equation look like? Like, um, for example, there was a problem and it said, yeah, I wanted me to write the equation. Um, let me see. Uh, do you know what, what that one was from? I, I think she means when you have write the equation for the nth term in an arithmetic sum ah, or okay. geometric um, sequence where n okay. is just a variable. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So let, well, let's, let's take a look at this one. So yeah, so that, that one's actually pretty easy. So, so do you see, do you understand where, uh, do you understand where this formula is coming from? Uh, yeah. I, this. Okay. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at that. So let me just take down a couple of notes here. So our third term is uh, 60 plus two times six and our 180th So, so, so here's, you know, again, I, I'm a big fan of writing things out. Uh, so if you, if you look at our third term, if you look at our 180th term, um, now we want to generalize it. We want to write the nth term. So let's look at this. We always have a 60. We always have a plus. We always have a times six. The thing that changes is the multiplier. So how do you get the multiplier? So for our third term, we multiply by two. For our 180th term, we multiply by 179. So what's the relationship between the, uh, between the uh, term number and the thing we're multiplying by? The term minus one. It's the term minus one. So if I'm dealing with the nth term, then the uh, then what I want to multiply by is n minus 1. So that's going to be n. Second here. And there we go, n minus 1. So yeah, so again, that's that. So so that's making this connection that once you know the term number, you're multiplying by one less than the term. So if I want to multiply, if I want to find the nth term, then that's going to be the term n minus one. Okay, I get it now. Seeing it this way, thank you. Okay, all right. So let's look at those uh, surface area and uh, surface area and volume problems. So. Okay, so we want to find the area of the figure. So remember, area is uh, area is the number of again, arithmetic is bookkeeping, algebra is generalized arithmetic, geometry is bookkeeping. Uh, area is the number of unit squares. So, uh, so here, um, our distance between adjacent rows and columns is one unit. So if I take a look at a figure that looks like this, uh, then the area of this figure is going to be, well, there's one square, there's two squares. So the area of that figure is going to be two square units. So, uh, so we can figure out the, uh, figure out the area of a, uh, of a region. Um, Rectangles are pretty easy. We just add up the out of the figures. Uh, the other thing that's uh, the other thing that we want to be able to compute is if I have a triangle. So if I have a triangle, and here's the thing: if you know the area of a rectangle, if you know the area of a right triangle, you can compute any area that's bounded by straight lines. Uh, what's the area of a triangle? Well, the way to remember that triangle is if I fill it out so that it's a rectangle, so if I fill out a rectangle, that triangle 
is half of the enclosing rectangle. So if I want to find the area of a triangle, it's half the area of the rectangle that would include it. So, um, so, so those are your basic area formulas. Now let's uh, see if we can put them together. So earlier I mentioned the idea of scotch tape and scissors. So I have a figure. If I want to find the area of this figure, one of the things I can try to do is I can try and see how I would make this from a uh, from a uh, from a larger figure. Uh, so I'm going to cut it out from. I'm going to cut this out from this figure. I'm going to enclose it. I'm going to put it into a box. And if I want to get the area of the figure, I need to get rid of a bunch of pieces. So let's see if we can do that. So the area. So let's start off with the box. The whole thing. How big is it? How many squares do I have inside that box? And we could do this in two ways. We can either count them, which, you know, again, we, counting is easy enough. Uh, the other thing to remember is that, uh, well, if I count them, here's one, two, three, four. Here's another four. Here's another four and another and another and another. So how many fours are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six fours. And so my area is six times four. You might remember that the area of a rectangle is product of length and width. Well, that's where it comes from. Here's my width, four. Here's my height in this case, and the height is six. And so I'm adding together six fours, and that corresponds to that multiplication. So that's the box it came in. So now let's start removing pieces. Uh, let's start with this triangle. Ah, that's a terrible drawing. Uh, let's start off with this bit here. How big is that triangle? Well, it's half the rectangle it came in. So how big is the rectangle it came in? Is it two? It's, uh, the rectangle that triangle came in that has one, two, it has three, uh, it has three squares in it. So when I remove that triangle, the triangle is half of three. It's three halves. So that's gone now. Let's get rid of this triangle. So how big is this triangle? Well, it's half the box it came in. So how big is the box? Here's the box. How big is that? Six. Six. So the triangle is half of that. So the triangle is going to be three. So I'm going to get rid of another three. How about this one? Is it one? Okay, so how big is the how big is the box? So so so, so be careful on that. So so uh, this is probably not helped by my drawing here. Um, clean that up a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see what that triangle is. Yeah, there we go. 
So there's the box the triangle came in. So how big is that box? Three. So that's three. So uh, so the uh, so that triangle that we're getting rid of this amount here is going to be another three halves. Okay, now this piece is going to be a little bit complicated. So the key idea, the thing to remember here is that we know how to find the areas of rectangles and we know how to find the areas of right triangles. So um, the trick here is, well, again, scotch tape and scissors. If I want to cut, well, I want to cut this piece out, but then I do need to figure out what the area of that piece is. If I wanted to make this piece, what do I tape together? I would probably tape together this square and then these two triangles. So how big is a square? That's going to be four, right? There's one, two, three, four square units there. And then the two triangles, this triangle here, this one in the, uh, Uh, this triangle in the upper right, what's the area of that one? Well, it's half the box it comes in. So fill out the box. How big is the box? Two squares, so it's Two one. Two squares, so it's going to be one, right? So, yeah, so that's going to be one. Subtract that. And then we have this one, this triangle. So it's two? It's going to be two, right? So again, if you look at the box that that triangle would come in, that box has area four, so the triangle has half that area, and so that triangle is going to have area two. And so that's going to be 24 minus, um, then we have to do a bunch of uh, computations here. That is, what is that? That's uh, 3, 6, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's minus 13. And so that says that our area is going to be 11. And so, so really finding any, any area of any figure that's bounded with straight lines, uh, it really comes down to um, uh, take your figure and start removing or sometimes gluing together some uh, maybe the thing to do uh, and start adding or subtracting uh, triangles and rectangles because we know how to find the area of a triangle or a rectangle. Uh, worst case scenario, we just count boxes and that's our area for a rectangle. Um, again, the thing to remember is that a triangle is half of the box it comes in. And so we can start with our bigger figure. And again, scotch tape and scissors, mostly scissors in this case, we cut out the pieces that we don't want. So volumes, so, so volumes and surface areas are going to be- um, The cube. Cubes, right? So a volume is how many cubes do we have? So so for example we'll pretend these are cubes. Come on. Can we move this? Come on. 
that one reveals this. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll try and move it. I'll try and move it off the. Uh, so, so if we want to find volume, so again, volume is a uh, number of cubes, and surface area is squares on the outside. So let's think about this. Uh, so again, the thing that you really want to, uh, uh, the thing you really want to, why is this not letting me move this? Okay, I'm having some computer difficulties here. All right, I'm not going to try to move it. Uh, okay, so uh, so the uh, so the volume is just the number of cubes, and so we can go ahead and count them. So one of the difficulties here is to remember remember that our picture is shown in perspective, so we can't actually see all of the cubes. Uh, but it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 20. So uh, we have 25 cubes in the first layer. Um, how many cubes behind it? 25. Yeah, we'd expect it to be 25. Um, so I could write 25 plus 25, uh, but here's a nice little review. What's another way of saying 25 plus 25? 25 times 2. It's 25 times 2. So if you know the volume formula for a rectangular prism, uh, what that comes from is, again, the idea is that I'm doing a uh, repeated addition of, a, uh, of, of an amount. So the volume here is going to be 50 cubic units. OK. Now, there we go. So now let's take a look at our surface area. All right, so let me erase those markers. So the volume is just the front and back technically? Well, it's uh, so, so if this had three layers, so if this had three layers, then we'd have it, uh, 25 times three. So, so it's basically uh, because the, because the way that the figure is, uh, once we know how many cubes are in this front, outermost layer uh, is just a question of how many layers that we ha how many layers we have behind it. So if this had a third layer behind it, then we'd have uh, three times 25. But how would you know? How would well, you well, know? I mean, well, you can count them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this, well, well, in this, we only, we only see that there's two layers. So, so we have our first layer here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it would depend on the drawing. So here we have our first layer here and our second layer there. Uh, so if we had another one, we would have, you know, so I'm not going to try to draw this in anything resembling perspective, but uh, yeah, so, 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 yeah, that's a horrible drawing. Uh, but yeah, so here, so if we had something like that, then we'd have three layers and then we'd multiply it by three. But, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. So now yes, I yeah. get it. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. You would you would go by what the drawing looks like. Okay. So how about surface area? So again, these are the squares that are showing on the outside. So this one is. So let's think about this. So let's count the ones that are facing us. Uh, so here's one. Well, actually. Okay, so so here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you think about it, we should actually get twenty-five because uh, we are just we're still counting the cubes. Uh, it's just we're counting the uh, cubic faces in front of us. Now, here's where you have to think about this as a three-dimensional object. So there's 25 squares facing us. What else does that tell you? There's 25 on the other side. Yeah, there, there, there's an opposite side to this figure that we can't see it. Uh, we can't see it, but on the opposite side of this figure, uh, if, you, if you think about what that figure has to look like, uh, there has to be 
another 25 squares on the opposite face as well that we can't see. So we can think about this as front and back. So our front face, 25 squares, our back face, also 25 squares. Uh, how about, um, let's look at what we might think about as our right hand side. So here, so these are the okay. these are the squares we're going to see on the right hand side. So it's these two. These are not on our right hand side. We might call these on the top. Uh, so we have these twelve. These we have twelve, right? So there's going to be twelve. Now this one takes a little bit more visualization. Uh, how about our left side? 12. It's going to be 12 as well. Um, here's kind of how, here's how I see it. Uh, so just, uh, you know, just to give you some insight into, into how you might think about this. The way I see it is if I take these 12 squares that are facing to the right, if I just slide them over, if I slide these over to the left-hand side, they cover up the left-hand side. So there's 12 squares on the left, and so there's going to be 12 squares on the right. How about the top? So if I look down from the top, uh, what do I see? 10. I see 10, right? So, uh, so it's the six here. It's the six here. But then I also see these two, and then I also see those two. So there's 10 on the top face. And then on the bottom, Ten. There's also going to be another ten, and again, again, the way that I think about this is if I take these uh, these squares that are on the top face, if I just drop them straight down to the bottom, they cover up uh, the bottom. Uh, so our surface area is we're just going to add up all of the uh, all of the um, all of the uh, uh, all of the squares that we have. So what that's fifty plus twenty four plus twenty, and that's going to be what ninety four. So a total of 94 squares altogether. All right. So let me close with uh, uh, let me close with one last idea on this. Uh, so um, so uh, what happens if we so so here's a here's an interesting uh, thing that actually happens that is uh, uh, relevant in a lot of areas outside of mathematics. Uh, basically, any of the sciences, any of the, uh, yeah, any of the sciences actually have to contend with this. Um, this figure has a volume of 50 cubic units. If we break this apart. So I'll ask this question. If we break this part into individual cubes, uh, what's the total surface area? So I know there's 50 cubes. So if I take one of those cubes, what's the surface area of a single cube? Wait, say that again, I'm sorry. So, so, so if I take a single cube, so I take one of these cubes, doesn't really matter which one. I take one of these cubes, and if it's separated from all the others, so I'm going to break this figure apart into its individual cubes. Uh, what's the surface area of a single cube? How many squares do I have on the outside? Six. It's how many? Six. Six, right? So, yes, yeah, so there's a front, back, left, right, top, bottom. So there's six, uh, each individual cube would have a surface area of six. And so my total surface area, that's going to be 50. That's going to be 50 sixes, 50 times six. And that's going to give you a total surface area of 300. And uh, so, so the, the interesting thing here is that if I, I have a volume 
and it has a surface area, the figure has a surface area of 94. Uh, but if I break this volume up into a lot more pieces, that surface area goes up by a considerable amount. And this is actually a fairly important thing in, again, many of the sciences because um, all chemical reactions, all changes, all interactions take place at the surface. And so what happens is if I take a substance, um, it might not be very reactive if I keep it all together, but if I break it apart into a whole bunch of pieces, if I powder it, the surface area goes way up and the reactivity increases significantly. And that's a nice little consequence of this uh, relationship between surface area and volume. Thank you. So to be clear, the, the volume is the front, like you count the front face and add it and do like a repeated addition of the amount of columns that are on your right that you see on your right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the, basically, I mean, uh, what you're really doing is you're just counting the total number of cubes that you have. Um, and the easiest way of doing that is, uh, again, in this particular case, it's uh, it's we uh, we can count the number of cubes we have that are facing us. And if all of our layers are uh, are going to be identical, then, uh, then, then we would, then we can, then, then it's just going to be uh, the number of cubes on that front layer times however many layers we have. Got it. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. So, um, all right. So, any other questions over any, 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 anything else? Uh, Hello, I have a question, but it's about the exam. Uh, sure. Uh, for the final, when once we're finished, do we have to uh, do? How do we do? We upload our work after we submit, or we have to, or do, are we given time? How how does that work? To upload? Yeah, yeah, you'll have time afterwards. So, so I mean, probably the easiest thing to do is as you finish it, you can upload it then. And that's, uh, but but after the exam finishes, you'll have you know, you'll have about uh, yeah, call it about a half an hour at least to uh, upload the work that you've written up for each individual question. So we have to press submit and then upload our work, or we have to. Uh, so, so the way that it, uh, so, so typically the way a problem will look. Uh, let me see if I can uh, pull something up from. Let me get. Uh, uh, let me see. So, so the problems that you'll get. Uh, they'll look like um, yeah. So so they'll typically look something like this. So again, this is calculus. So don't worry about the questions. Uh, but there'll be like a question here, and then there'll be a place where you can uh, upload your work. And so here, um, if you um, if you've done your work and it's easy enough, you can upload it here at this point uh, um, into yeah yeah into this answer box that's right next to the question. Uh, otherwise, after you finish the exam, um, let me see if I can, let me see if I can show you what this looks like. After you finish the exam, you'll also have a chance to do that. Um, I have to switch to a student view. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so after you, so after you finish the exam, uh, then what you'll be able to do 
is to uh, so uh, and, and after you after you finish the exam, there will be a screen that says, "Do you want to upload work?" and it'll give you the option. Uh, but what that'll look like is something like this. So you'll see the exam questions. Uh, you'll see the exam questions. Uh, you won't be able to change any answers at that point, uh, but then you'll have again this type of answer box where you can upload or add add any work that's relevant to the uh, uh, to the problem and and add that as well or add that to the uh, to the to what you're submitting. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Anything else? Any any other questions? Any? Uh, let's see. Yeah. The chat. Uh, let's stop that. 